Previously on You Can Beat Video Games. In part one of this guide, we built a party, we defeated Garland, we rescued Princess Sarah and got the loot, we leveled up at the Peninsula of Power, we delved deep into the Marsh Cave and woke the Sleeping Prince, then we went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Lich and stopped the Earth from rotting. Three more orbs must be restored before this world can be saved, so that will be our mission here in part two. Before we get into that, there are two things that I didn't show in part one that I'd like to show here. The first is this treasure from the Earth Cave Basement 4. And we got it. The second is a secret way to make tons of money in the early game. Once you have the ship, save your game in an inn, and then turn off the power. Don't just reset the game, you need to turn the power all the way off. Whenever you continue, you want to go straight to your ship and try to find a fight in the ocean. The first battle that you'll always face will be against some number of Kaizoku. If you remember from the first video, Kaizoku drop a ton of money, so this could be a very profitable battle for us early in the game. Once we reach level 5, we'll want to go over to the secret level up zone to make more money. But until then, we can use this to get the best possible equipment, and also to buy some expensive level 3 spells that we'll need to level up more quickly. So if you need 1500 extra gold to be able to buy Fire 3, this could be a good way to do it. You could do it as many times as you want. After each battle, just save the game, turn the power off and continue, and you'll come back and fight more Kaizokus. The reason that this works is because whenever we turn the game off, we reset the game's random number generator, or RNG, and whenever we start the game up fresh, well, it starts at the very beginning of that table. So it always is going to give us Kaizokus as the first enemy that we fight if we fight an enemy on the sea. There are a lot of ways that you can actually manipulate RNG in this game, and most of them are going to be beyond the scope of this video, but this is a very easy and very practical way to get some money in the very early part of the game. So if you need some cash to buy some equipment, or to buy some expensive level 3 spells, this is a great way to do it. Now that we fought the Kaizokus, we're going to go back to the inn. We'll save the game and turn off the power. And whenever we continue, we should be able to fight those Kaizokus again. So let's see if it works. We'll go out to sea. And there you have it. With that business out of the way, it's time for Chapter 4, Warriors in the Sky. With Lich defeated, we've returned to the city of Melman. Our mission in Chapter 4 is to find the airship, a Final Fantasy staple. This will really open the game up for us, but before we can find it, there are several things that we need to do. First, we can finally afford that steel armor. It does cost an arm and a leg, but it provides 34 absorb, which is going to really help as we move forward here. The encounters are only going to get more difficult in Chapter 4, so we need all the help that we can get. You may think that defeating Lich would do something in the town of Melmond, but what it actually unlocks is in the city of Crescent Lake. So that's where we're going to head now. We've been to this area before, and we've certainly fought these giants before, so they are not a big deal. Remember that we can use ice magic against them simply because ice deals more damage than fire or lit, but giants don't have any specific elemental weaknesses, so the extra damage does go a long way in this fight. And with that, we leveled up Vito and game. Alright, we're getting some level 14 characters now, which is going to help as we move forward. As we round the bend here, we can, well, there's one more battle, and we've certainly fought these guys before. Recall that the Cobras are not poisonous. You would think that they are, but they're not. But they do have a higher critical hit rate than other enemy types. The Scorpions are still the ones that you have to worry about because they are poisonous. 
but Fire 2 should take out these guys without a lot of problems. Have both of your casters use it, because we can just use the inn whenever we go to the town here. It shouldn't take too much more to defeat these guys. And that Fire 2 should do it. With the Scorpion and Cobras defeated, we should be able to level up the rest of our party. Well, you can, Will, anyway. Beat is still lagging behind because he died when we were fighting Astos earlier in the game. Getting poisoned is not as big of a deal in this part of the game as it was earlier, but it still changes our party order, and we don't like that because remember from the first video that 50% of enemy attacks will be targeted at whoever is in that top slot. Crescent Lake is known for its silversmiths, but it's also known for the Circle of Sages. If you head behind the magic shops, you can find them over here to the right. One of the sages is Lucon, and he's the one that made the prophecy that said, The four light warriors will come, each bearing an orb. That's about us, so it's about time that we visited this guy. Whenever we talk to the sages, one of them is going to give us the canoe. Just go around the circle, and the one that you're looking for is this one right here. He's happy that we defeated the Earth Fiend, and we get the canoe as a reward. The canoe will allow us to travel along rivers, and it will open up several new locations for us. Talking to the sages here, it seems very clear that the game wants us to go to this Gurgu Volcano so that the Fire Fiend won't burn everything up. But that's not what we're going to do. The volcano's in an out-of-the-way area, and while there is a decent amount of loot there, the rewards for completing the volcano are not really that good. If we can complete the ice cave, we'll get the airship, and that would be awesome, except that the ice cave may be the most difficult dungeon in the game, featuring a bunch of enemies that can instant kill our party members. So what about a third outside the box option? You may not be aware of this, but once you have the canoe, you can actually reach the castle of Ordeal. Growing up as a kid, I always thought that you had to have the airship to reach the castle, and while you do need the airship to redeem the tail and get our characters promoted, we don't need it to actually go to the castle. You can see how the canoe works, you simply walk up to the water and it's used automatically. And before we go on to the castle of Ordeal, we should definitely stop at Elfland and buy some soft potions. Soft potions are extremely important here. Remember, if one of your party members is turned to stone, you'll have to drag their statue around until you heal them with a soft potion. So it's essentially like they're dead. Yeah, you do not want to be caught without soft potions in the Castle of Ordeal, so purchase at least 10 of them before you move forward. It would probably be better to have even a few more. I have good news and bad news about this next dungeon. The good news is it's very short, so that's nice. The bad news is we are extremely underleveled for it, and while we'll be able to fight some of the battles in there, there are a few that we're going to need to run from. So the best plan here is to get right outside the castle and we're going to use a tent or a cabin to save just in case things go awry. And you'll see there's a very easy way to get to the castle. You just take the southern port from Elfland and go down. Remember, at this point in the game, the battles that you face in the ocean are extremely trivial. Look at this shark. He has 120 HP. We can take this guy out in a single swing, no problem. And we also get to level up here, which is nice. So, Beat joins us at level 14 and you're going to see the easy way to get to the Castle of Ordeal. That's it, that's all you have to do. Using the airship, you have to walk from way farther away, and you're going to have to deal with very dangerous encounters on the world map, possibly even T-Rex, which is the most dangerous enemy you could face on the world map. This old man is like the castle bouncer. He tells us that we need the crown to be able to enter. Yeah. How would we have gotten here without the crown, dude? Alright, in any case, there's no enemies on the first floor, but up here on the second floor there are. You need to touch these pillars to move forward, and here is our first battle. 
and it is an extremely bad one. If you see these guys run away, they will use fire magic on us, which can destroy our party. And we got away pretty quickly there, so that was good. Touch that pillar, and in this case we want to touch the lower pillar. If you touch the top one, it'll take you backwards, so don't do that. Over here we want to touch the lower pillar again. This area is fairly straightforward, so just touch the pillar at the end of the hallway, and then you want to touch the closer pillar when you come out up here. Once we get to this room, we're going to find a piece of treasure here, and this is one of the big reasons why we came to this castle so early. But first, we're going to face some Medusas, and this is why we stopped in Elfland to buy those soft potions. Shockingly, these guys are the ones that can turn us to stone. Make sure to take these guys seriously and hit them with a big blast of magic. They only have 68 hit points, so it should only take one spell to wipe most of them out. Oh, there it is. That's the move that we were worried about, and our fighter has been turned to stone. Luckily, we do have soft potions for that. Fire 2 should finish this battle no problem. And it looks like we survived. With those Medusas defeated, we can use a soft potion and then rearrange our party. And with that all finished, we can head over into the treasure room in the upper right. This is what we came for. In this room, we're going to find one of the best weapons in the game, and you may be surprised to find out that it's a piece of armor. Yeah, pretty weird. These mud ghouls are the guardian of this space, and they have very high magic defense, so I don't recommend using spells on them. Instead, just attack them with your melee attacks. They only have 176 hit points, so they should go down pretty fast. And with those mud ghouls out of the way, we can finally claim our prize. The Zeus Gauntlet. A mysterious piece of armor that nobody in our party can currently equip. But that's not what it's for. Whenever the Zeus Gauntlet is used as an item in battle, it will cast the Lit 2 spell for free. Yeah, for free. This is one of the most amazing items in the entire game, and it's going to allow our melee characters to be able to use magic, which is just crazy. We don't need it here on this guarded space though. These nightmares are weak against ice magic, so a little bit of ice too should take them out with no problem. Split up your melee attacks between the top and the bottom horse, and you should be able to finish off these guys. Once they're defeated, if you want to get the treasure chest, just be aware that you are going to have to step through this space again, but it's going to be worth it. In that chest is another item that we definitely want. And up here, it looks like we hit another standard encounter, and it's more of those red gargoyles. We gotta run from these guys. They are just extremely dangerous, and here's that Fire 2. If we take multiple hits of Fire 2, it could easily kill our whole party, so that's why we're running away. There's not a lot we can do about it at this point in the game. There is an ice armor hidden deep in the ice cave, which would provide some protection, but that's only gonna help out one person in our party. Up here we'll find the Heal Staff, and this is another one of those items that you can use to get a magic effect in battle. So if you use it as an item when you're in a battle, it will cast the spell of Heal, which will restore just a small amount of health to all members of our party. Definitely not as good as the Zeus Gauntlet, but it's something that your characters can do if you're in an advantageous position in battle, and you don't have a lot else that they need to be doing. Up here we find the Ice Sword, which is a great weapon that we'll be using for a long time. And these Mancat enemies are just as bad, if not worse, than those Argoyles. They'll also use Fire 2 magic on you, so you need to run away from these guys. The Ice Sword has that extra damage to fire enemies property, and these type of properties do not work in the NES version. I did a lot of the math just to confirm this, and while they do work in the remake versions of the game, you won't get any bonus damage from the weapons when you're using them here. Still, the Ice Sword deals a lot of base damage, so we're going to be happy to have it. 
And we'll also pick up this gold bracelet, which is the best piece of wizard armor that you can find at this point in the game. With so many good treasures in this place, you can see why we wanted to visit it early. It's definitely worth running away from man cats and red gargoyles to be able to get the ice sword, the heel staff, the Zeus gauntlet, and the gold bracelet. Normally, you would actually run into mostly zombies on floor 2. We hit a pretty bad run of encounters here, but one thing to remember, if you do run into zombies, you can't run away from them. But they are easy to fight, we've fought a lot of them already. In this treasure chest, we'll find the tail, which we'll need a little bit later to get promoted. And before we can leave, we need to fight the boss, the zombie dragons. These guys are more of a mini boss than an actual boss, but by using the Zeus Gauntlet, Fire 2 from our Red Mage, and Fire 3 from our Black Mage, we should be able to easily finish these guys off. There is a danger if they attack some of your party members that they could get stunned, so you certainly want to take these zombie dragons out as quickly as possible. Once they're defeated, you'll be able to touch the throne behind them, and that will take us back to floor 1 where there's no enemies, and we'll be able to exit the Castle of Ordeal. So we can just walk right out the front door. It seems that the old man is gone now. He doesn't need to tell us that we need the crown. Not that we needed that information anyway. And now all we need to do is make this short walk back to our ship. First though, it looks like we're going to run into a few of these Catman enemies, and these guys are a lot less dangerous than the man-cat enemies that we met inside the castle. For instance, these guys don't cast any fire magic. What these guys can do is poison us, but at this point in the game, we don't care about poison. We spent the last several years building up a tolerance to Iocane powder. We can't be poisoned very effectively anymore. So fight these guys off using our new Zeus gauntlet and a few types of fire magic or ice magic or whatever you want to use on these guys. They don't have any specific elemental vulnerabilities. There's only one left, so an all-out attack should finish him off. And once these cat men are gone, we can head back to either Elfland or Provoka. They're both relatively close to this area and we can heal up from there. We'll want to use a pure potion here to take care of our man Vito. Vito doesn't like being poisoned. It really cramps his style. We'll also want to rearrange our party as usual. Vito is still a little bit more heavily armored than Beat, although we will want to move Beat to that second position eventually. Down here we can visit the city of Provoka using that port on the backside, which is near the secret level up zone. And as we walk across, we meet our good friend, the Ogre. There's still a lot of them out here. We can't exterminate them all. In Provoka, we're just kind of stopping here to use the item store. We'll need to restock on heal potions before we move forward, because the next dungeon is going to be quite dangerous. It takes a long time to buy 99 potions because of the shop owner's strict one item per transaction policy stupid Final Fantasy taxes, but it is worth the time investment. You are going to need those potions in the Ice Cave. Of course, they won't help you with the Ice Cave's biggest problem, which are enemies that can instantly kill our party members. The best way to get to the Ice Cave is to dock your ship by this river at the top of the Southeast Continent. Up here in the river we'll fight a new enemy, an Ocho, and this guy's not particularly dangerous. He doesn't cast any magic, and all it really can do is poison us. Any single enemy like that that doesn't have a very strong attack is not going to be a big problem. So just use a pure potion if one of your guys gets poisoned, and quickly take out the Ocho and move on. The bigger concern is whenever you have to fight Ochos with more enemies, and that is where our Zeus Gauntlet is really going to shine, because these guys are all weak against lit magic, much like the enemies at sea. So the river monsters are similar in that respect, they're all water type enemies. So our Zeus Gauntlet is going to be very effective here. Just free magic spells. We want to save our magic for the ice cave, so you don't want to have our casters wasting any lit spells on these very easy enemies. 
The rivers are a bit of a maze, so you want to stay on the far right and take them to the top, and then take this lower fork. Here we'll fight a Hydra. This is only a single enemy, and while it doesn't have a particular vulnerability to lightning like a lot of the other enemies here on the river, an all-out attack will quickly eliminate this guy. Yeah, get out of here, Hydra. Very, very easy enemy to defeat. Take this first left, and this path will take us the whole way to the ice cave. Over here we encounter another Hydra. Get out of here, Hydra. And down here we'll be able to exit the canoe. Whenever we exit the canoe, we'll be able to fight more normal enemies. And, well, it's more of our good friends, the ogres. Let's see how they like the Zeus Gauntlet. We'll call down a little bit of lightning from Mount Olympus on these guys. And, oh, oh, it doesn't seem like they liked it at all. And you can see how effective that ice sword is. It's a good thing that we picked that up. And with this battle complete, we leveled up Vito and Game to level 15. Very nice. And that little cave is it, so we're going to use a tent out here to save the game. No matter how well prepared you think you may be, you can definitely die in the ice cave, so make sure that you save outside here. The first floor is not particularly dangerous, not compared to the other floors. I mean, our bones, these are just simple undead enemies with only 144 hit points. We have our Zeus Gauntlet, and we can use a little bit of fire magic here. We may want to conserve some of our fire magic because almost all of the enemies here are going to be either ice enemies or undead, so they're pretty much all going to be vulnerable to fire magic. We only have a limited amount of fire magic between Vito and Game, although Game has several castings of fire 3 if we need it. We'll certainly want to save those until we're desperate. Make your way around this bend to the right, and head back to the left, and that's where we're going to find our first stairway. But before that, seven wizards. Wow, this would have been a disaster earlier in the game, but now that we have the Zeus Gauntlet to get free castings of lit, and we can add in some lit twos from our black and red mages as well, these guys are no longer the problem that they once were. You still can't run away from them though, so make sure to stand your ground against any wizards that you face, and take them out using your Zeus Gauntlet and a little bit of magic. The Zeus Gauntlet is just unfair against these guys. They'll just go down so quickly. Seven wizards down, and a promotion for Beat to level 15. Things are going well so far. We'll want to take the time to heal everybody up, just to make sure everyone is safe. And we'll take this stairway down to basement 2. You can go either direction here, both will get you to the stairway, but there are some extremely dangerous enemies you can meet on this floor. These are not them. You're lucky if you just meet undead enemies like this. The ones you gotta worry about are sorcerers or mages. Either of those enemy types could definitely do instant kill attacks on your party. These wraiths are something we can actually fight though. They're more dangerous than those images that we fought a few moments ago, and we fought the images before. These are like the next level up on those. As usual, we can use fire magics to get some good attacks on these undead, but we don't really need to waste too much magic here. We'll just use our Zeus Gauntlet with the Black Belt and some fire magic from our black mage and it looks like we leveled up our fighter so excellent getting everyone up to level 15. we survived that floor so that's good news and this one's very short in here there's a treasure room and there are three treasures in here there's one that has a flame sword, and that's something we can pick up. It's not as good as the ice sword, but it's something that, you know, we could potentially use with our red mage, maybe. This guy is one of the dangerous enemies. He's somebody that can kill you with a rub magic spell. We don't have anything to prevent that at this point in the game. Just one mage isn't too bad, though. What you have to worry about are teams of three or four of them. 
which could definitely clear your whole party in a single round. Over here on the left side, we'll find that flame sword, and you'll notice that you could get the chest on the right side, but you do not want to get the chest on the right side. It's not good. It's just a cloth armor, and there is an extremely dangerous encounter in front of it. Once you have the flame sword, you can drop into any of those holes, and it will bring you down onto this floor, where we'll have to face a team of undead. It could be a lot worse than this. Sometimes you may have to fight like nine enemies here. Four is not that big of a deal. If you do meet the full complement of undead, don't hesitate to use one of your fire three spells, but for this number, we can be a little bit more conservative. We'll just use some fire two and the Zeus gauntlet and that should take care of these guys no problem. This is a very large floor and there is a great piece of armor over on the left side. Unfortunately, it's guarded by these frost dragons, which are very dangerous, and oh. Oh, we randomly ran into frost dragons. If you randomly run into frost dragons, run away, because they do this blizzard attack, and that can clear out your party very fast. So those are the guys that guard that ice armor, and that's why we're not going to go and get it right now. We're going to avoid most of the treasures on this floor and just try to get the one that we need, the floater. That's the item that we'll need to get the airship. Once we have the airship, we'll have access to much better equipment and we can come back here and get those treasure chests later. Make your way over to this stairway. And up here, well, cockatrices could turn us to stone, but we should be able to easily take these guys out using our magic and our Zeus gauntlet. You can see why we wanted to get that Zeus gauntlet early. It makes the whole game a lot easier, and we're still going to be using that Zeus gauntlet way deep into the game. So it's one of the more important items to grab. We do have the flame sword here, but it doesn't actually provide any bonuses against undead enemies, as you might think that it would. If you were playing the PlayStation version though, those bonuses would work. Mummies have an attack that can put our party members to sleep, but we should be able to finish off these enemies before they ever become a problem. Down here, there's just a potion. And in that lower treasure chest, there's a lot of money, but we're going to be coming back here anyway, so we can just get it then. Another set of wizards. There's fewer of them this time, so they're even easier to beat. Make sure to keep healing up between battles. And in this room, we're going to find a hole that will lead us to where that floater item is. Before we grab it though, there are some treasure chests that are convenient here. And one of them, this one, is the ice shield, which will be nice whenever we go to that volcano level. The bonus elemental damages on weapons don't work in this version of the game, but don't get confused. On armor, the elemental defense properties are effective. Once you have the ice shield, make sure to equip it, and then we're just going to jump into that hole in the ground, which will take us to the middle of basement 2-B, and that's where we'll find the floater. But first, it's time to have a staring contest with the eye. The eye looks very intimidating, and he can cast a ton of different magic spells that can instantly kill our party. You may want to use some fast magic to make your melee attackers more effective, but he only has 162 hit points, so a few attacks should be able to remove him quickly. The issue is if he knocks off a few of your party members, we still have to walk out of this place. On this space, we'll face a random assortment of undead, as we always do. And we're going to bring out the big guns since we're close to the end here, and we'll use Fire 3 to turn these guys to ashes. Although it looks like Fire 2 is doing a pretty good job on its own. We also have the Zeus Gauntlet to back us up, and it looks like that was a good idea considering that our Black Mage ended up stunned and was never going to get to cast Fire 3. Bad stuff can happen sometimes when you're fighting undead, so it's good to make sure that everybody uses their best attacks. Whenever you cross these icy areas, you do take a bit of damage, but the good news is, you'll never hit a monster encounter on one of those spaces. Sorcerers. Now, 
these are some of the more dangerous enemies we can fight here. These guys have an attack that's weak on damage, but can instantly kill our party members. They also have this trance spell that can paralyze some of us, which is pretty bad. Even if you have items to prevent rub spells, the sorcerer's attack can still kill you through that, so those guys will always be dangerous. We were lucky to survive that, and now we'll make our way to the stairs, and the way out of here is simple. We just need to get back here to floor one, and instead of going into that room down below with the hole in it, we're going to take the upper path, and we'll find a stairway there that'll get us out of here. Some more undead enemies we had to face there. We probably should heal up a bit, and since we're close to the end, now could even be a good time to try out some of our cure magic, which we don't usually use since we favor our offensive spells. And with that, we're on to Chapter 5, Rewards of Courage. With the floater in our possession, all we need to do is get out of this river maze and claim our airship. We can find it in the small desert located south of Crescent Lake. So we'll just take our ship and follow the continent down to the bottom. We can weigh anchor here by this small river. And once you actually get into the desert area, there is no enemy encounters in the sand. So you're safe there. Use the floater and the airship will appear. Once we have it, where should we go? Well, if you head straight down south, we can find a new town, the town of Gaia. It's been a while since we found a new town and nestled up here within these mountains, we come upon Gaia. As you may expect from a place that's so remote, everything is really expensive here. 500 gold to use the inn? For that much money, I'm gonna need a lot more than fluffy pillows and a continental breakfast. Up here at the Gaia Armor Shop, we can sell off a few items we don't need anymore, but more importantly, these guys sell some top tier gear. The gold bracelets cost a fortune, and it would be nice to have a couple more of those, but even more importantly, there's Pro Rings, which are the top gauntlet in the entire game. And I'm not talking just for characters like mages, it's the best gauntlet that even a fighter can wear. At 20,000 gold a pop, the pro rings are a bit pricey, but we at least want to get a few of them to replace the gloves that some of our characters have been wearing since the beginning of the game. Our fighter can wear other gauntlets, so we don't need to replace his right now, but eventually we are going to want to have all four of our characters wearing pro rings, so if you have the money, it could be a worthy investment right now. As we speak to the citizens in this new place, many of them are surprised that we even made it this far, and this guy tells us about the city of Lefine, where they speak a strange language. We won't be going there for a while, but it will come up later in the game. Over here we'll meet a broom that asks, Do you have great power? Well, do you have great power, broom? What do you think this is? Right now we don't actually have great power because we haven't been promoted yet, but that's the next thing that we're actually going to do. As we make our way over here, we can visit the weapon store, but they only sell one thing, the cat claw, and none of us can currently equip it. Down here, this guy tells us about a castle where we can test our courage. We've been there already, and we got the tail out of it, so we're certainly going to want to cash that in shortly. This woman talks about a shining object that fell in the east, another interesting clue, and if we take this path over here, we find a hidden magic shop, and also a clue about Oxyale. Oxyale is going to be the thing that we need to get into the water shrine, and without it, we won't be able to breathe under the sea. To get it, we'll need to visit the Fairy Spring, which is in this very town. But right now, the Fairy has checked out. We can take a quick stop up here in the item store, and we'll notice that they sell healing potions here, but it's not the top item in the list, making it kind of annoying to purchase a full supply of heal potions there. I don't really recommend doing that. 
We'll come back to Gaia and speak to the last few people later. But for now, let's head over to the Cardian Islands, where we'll be able to find a bunch of treasure and finally get ourselves promoted. That's right, it's time for the class change. Over here on these islands, there's a bunch of little holes in the ground, and inside these holes are these caverns, and there are no enemies in here, so you definitely want to come down in this place and loot all of the treasure chests. It's mostly money, but we can surely use some money to buy more pro rings or maybe even another gold bracelet. That would be nice. We can also speak to a few of these dragons. Strangely, there's a ton of dragon monsters that we fight in the game, but the dragons here on the Cardian Islands, well, they seem to be friendly and intelligent. I don't know if those other dragons have been corrupted by the chaos that's going on in the world, or something else, maybe they're just rogue dragons. But these guys, these guys are cool. There are no treasure chests hidden on this tiny island, so feel free to skip it if you want to. We will meet a dragon here that talks about Bahamut, who is the king of the dragons. The Final Fantasy games all take place in different worlds that are not connected to each other, but there are a bunch of common elements that unite them, and one of them is Bahamut, who makes his first appearance in this game. Bahamut is the king of the dragons, and he usually appears in the other Final Fantasy games as a very powerful summon magic spell. In this game, he's going to upgrade our characters, so it's a little bit different than many of the other appearances of Bahamut, but he is one of the iconic parts of the franchise. Unfortunately, some of the other iconic staples of the franchise, like chocobos or moogles, do not appear in this game. But it is pretty interesting to see the iconic elements that do appear here and how they evolve as the series progresses. Once you have all of the treasure in this cave, we can exit and get back to our airship. There are battles out here on the overworld, so you may hit a few of them. This guy is just an Ocho. I mean, we can certainly handle an Ocho. He's not a big problem, although... We did get poisoned. Annoying. Stupid Ochos. And we'll get the order right here and then head back to our airship. Not that if we were out of order here we'd probably meet anything too dangerous, but there are the red anklos that we could possibly meet, so those are slightly dangerous. Up here in this cave, there's a few more chests for us to pick up. This one has a cabin in it, so that's nice. It's not as good as several thousand gold, but you know, cabins are pretty helpful. A lot of these dragons are telling us about needing to go to the castle of Ordeal to prove our courage. We've done that already because we've gone a little bit out of order here. Normally you would get the airship first, and once you have the airship, you'd probably want to come right over here to these islands to pick up all this money but it does make sense to head over to the castle before you get the airship so you can get all of that good equipment, thus making the ice cave much, much easier. These manticores are a new enemy type. They can use a special attack called Stinger, which potentially could poison every member of the party, which would be very obnoxious. Would have to use four pure potions to fix that. Luckily, these guys only have 164 hit points, so it will not take much to clear them out. Down here, we can find another Cardia Island cave that doesn't have any treasures inside, just some information from these dragons about their dragon culture. It seems that the dragons here on the Cardia Islands are some sort of merchants, and that they only do profitable business. Very interesting. I wonder if these dragons had a store, if they would just let us purchase 99 healing potions at the same time, in just one transaction. If they did, I'd consider paying them a little bit of extra money for that. Since we're lazy, we'll use our airship to fly down to the lower corner of this island, and this is the main attraction here on the Cardia Islands. This is where King Bahamut is. 
Because we have the tail, whenever we talk to him, he's going to promote us. This promotion is technically optional, but it's going to feel mandatory because if we don't do it, we won't be able to wear any of the best armor in the game, we won't be able to wield any of the best weapons, and we won't be able to use any of the best spells. There is one exception here though, and that's the Black Belt. When the Black Belt turns into the Master, he actually gets slightly worse. Whenever your characters level up, they gain an invisible stat, which is magic defense. Whenever the Master levels up, he actually gains fewer points of magic defense than he would if he was a Black Belt. So if you were for some reason playing an entire party of four Black Belts, you would definitely want to avoid the Clash change. However, the trade-off for promoting the other three characters is definitely worth it. The Master is still going to be a very good character, but we needed to promote our fighter to the Knight so that he can use Excalibur later in the game, and he'll also be able to cast some white magic, which is nice. Our Red Mage will now be able to cast the Exit spell, which is awesome, and our Black Mage will now get access to the Nuke magic. You'll notice right away that now some of our characters can equip the Zeus Gauntlet. And that includes the Red Mage, which wasn't able to equip a very good gauntlet before. Although Pro Rings are still better for the armor value and the protection from rub. This will help us manage a little bit of our inventory space since we still want to carry around the Zeus Gauntlet to be able to use that Lit 2 magic for free. Once we're promoted, where should we go to next? Back when we got the canoe, the Circle of Sages really wanted us to take care of the Gurgu Volcano, so that's our next mission. Before we head over there though, we have access to new magic spells, so we should definitely stop in Melmond. At the White Magic Store, we should pick up the Life Magic for Vito. Life Magic is extremely useful. If any of our party members die, it's one of the only ways to bring them back to life. We'll also want Cure 3, which is the most powerful healing magic our Red Mage can use. Unfortunately, it's on the same level as Life. Down here in the Black Magic Store, we want to get the Warp Magic for our Black Mage. Warp Magic is one way that we can easily exit any of the dungeons that we're in without having to go all the way back out through some stairs. Warp Magic is not as good as the Exit spell, but we can't learn that one just yet on our Red Mage, so for now we're going to have to lean on our Black Mage and the Warp Magic. Whenever you cast Warp in a dungeon, it'll take you back to the previous floor, and if you cast it enough times, it'll take you out of the dungeon entirely. The White Magic spell Exit can take you out of a dungeon in a single casting, but it's a higher level spell and we won't be able to use it just yet, so for now we're going to lean on Warp. Make sure to sell off any excess weapons and armor that you have because there's going to be a ton of treasure to find in this volcano, and if you don't have any item space, you won't be able to carry it all. Once you're done in Melmond, we do have one more stop to make before we head over to the Gurgu Volcano, and that's down at the town of Elfland. Elfland is a town we spent a lot of time in back in the first part of the video, so it's kind of like an old home. We want to grab one more level 3 black magic spell that we haven't purchased yet, and that's Hold Magic. Hold Magic is going to be very useful on a boss here in the near future, so if you don't have it yet, make sure to purchase it before going on to the volcano. With all the magic items and equipment sorted out, we can fly straight over to the right from Elfland and that will take us almost to the volcano. You'll need to fly up a little bit to get there, but you can avoid the maze of rivers that lead to this place if you have an airship. Up here on the top floor you'll see this lava which is similar to the snow fields we crossed in the ice cave. It'll deal you a bit of damage when you're walking on it, but you won't meet any enemy encounters while you're on the lava. Up here we meet a new type of ogre, the Wiz Ogre. That guy is kind of annoying because he can cast Ruse Magic on himself. That's why we want to target our attacks at the Wiz Ogre first. Hopefully we can knock him off before we can use Ruse. And then we'll just be left with Shrek and Donkey here, 
which will be very easy to take out with just a few melee attacks. These guys can probably barely hurt us at this point in the game. You can see that our black belt is getting a lot more powerful. He's going to be much more involved in combat than he was earlier in the video series. Once the ogres are defeated, we'll head down these stairs and on floor B2 here, this is the treasure room. And once we step inside, we have a few familiar faces, a giant, which we've fought many times before, and an iguana, which we could have encountered outside of Provoka. We used our heal staff here just so I can show you what it does. It allows us to recover a minor amount of health on all of our characters, which is a nice thing we can do if we don't have a lot else for our black mage to be doing. He could just do an attack here, but our other characters are going to take care of it, and it could be a good opportunity to recover just a bit of health. The heal staff can also counter the effects of some enemy magic, so if enemies use something like Fire 2 against you, using a heal staff will recover some of that health. As we make our way over here to the left, this is a guarded space and we have a fire elemental that we're battling. Like most elementals, you can't run from this guy, and as you would expect, he's weak against ice magic. So we'll even use our level 1 ice spell here, and that did a decent amount of damage to him. Between that and our melee attacks, he should go down pretty quickly. The chest that he guards here, a silver helmet, is definitely not something we need. We may as well just drop it right now because there's going to be a lot more stuff that we want to pick up, and we're going to need that space. Down here at the bottom, we can find a nice chunk of money, and as we make our way back around, we're going to head over to the left. Before that, it looks like we ran into the Wiz Ogre, Green Ogre, Hyena combination again. And we know that we should try to take out that Wizard Ogre before he can cast Ruse on himself, and the rest of the enemies are mostly trivial. There are a few more scattered chests on this side, but the bulk of the treasure is in a room in the lower left. Here's another new enemy type, the Red Hydra. This guy can use a move called Cremate, which will deal fire damage to each member of our party, so that's kind of dangerous and I'll end up using a bunch of heal potions after the battle. The good news is, like most of the other enemies here, he's weak against ice magic, so even our trash tier ice spell will help. At the end of the battle, it looks like Beat leveled up to level 16, so that's good for him. And as we come around this corner, whew, that is a lot of peds. The peds have a lot of hit points and no particular elemental vulnerabilities, so we're not going to waste our ice magic on these guys. We're going to have whoever has the Zeus Gauntlet use it, and we're going to cast Lit 2 with whichever casters can cast them. That should take out most of these guys. Our goal is to try to clear two or three of them in the first round of combat, and then just clean up whatever is left. So there's Lit 2 from the Red Mage, and we'll also be using Lit 2 from the Black Mage. And that should clear out, yep, two of them. So we're just going to split our attacks between the remaining peds, and that should finish them off. None of these guys can have very many hit points left. Oh yeah, that guy's out of here. And one more shot, well, that would have taken him out in a single hit. Alright, we need to cure some poison, so we'll use a pure potion, which we should probably restock those at some point. And we'll fix the order up just a bit. Although it doesn't actually matter, we'll still switch the third and fourth position because I do prefer having the black mage down there at the bottom. In front of this chest is another one of those fire elementals, and inside is the giant sword, which just doesn't deal enough damage to be relevant, and the effect where it works against enemies in the giant category doesn't work here on the NES. So, even if you were playing this in the other versions of the game, like on PlayStation, you probably still wouldn't need the giant sword at this point in the game. Although there are a lot of giant enemies. These ogres are all in the giant category, imps are in the giant category, and of course, giants. But yeah, you're gonna want to stick with the ice sword, which deals 9 more damage. That's just way more. 
we're going to make our way around here to the upper left corner where there's two more chests that we want to pick up. But before that, well, it looks like we have a chance at some revenge against these red gargoyles, although they have ambushed us here, and that could be problematic. These guys are still dangerous. It was only a few minutes ago when we were running away from them in the Castle of Ordeal, but things have changed a bit. We lost the Black Mage there in the first round, but we do have the life magic now, so it's not as big of a disaster as it would have been before. We've leveled up a bit more since then as well, so let's see how well we handle these guys. Once they've all cast Fire 2 once, they won't be casting it again unless they can cycle all the way through their spells, which they won't. They should not last that long. If they did, we're in big trouble. That one got to Hold, which is the second spell that Red Gargoyles cast, and we're just gonna keep using our items, lit loose with some ice magic if you have it, and just keep taking these out one at a time if necessary. This should do it here, I think. Yeah, that's going to clear them all up. Alright, well, we survived that encounter with the red gargoyles, but it was pretty bad. It's a good thing we have that life magic. We only have one shot at it right now, though, so we can't let anyone else die. The good news is, we are not going to try to attempt to finish the volcano in one run. There's just way too much treasure here. The idea is to get all of the treasure here on floor B2, and once we've cleared that out, we can leave the volcano, and we'll go sell off anything we don't need, we'll restock any items that we need, and we'll come back fresh-faced, ready to take on the rest of the volcano. We got a little bit unlucky here and drew not one, but two fire elementals. But we're feeling pretty confident here. Everybody's at full health. The fire elementals don't actually cast any fire magic spells. And one shot of ice, too, is going to seriously damage them. So now we can just do an all-out attack on the bottom fire elemental. And I'm using that heal staff to try to restore a little bit of health, but we're getting pretty close to full now. And that's going to do it. One more shot should finish this guy off. Even though the red mage was using the flame sword, it doesn't have any negative effects. It is possible to get both of those treasures without touching that guarded space, but you'd have to go all the way around so it doesn't seem worth it. Down here, we only have to fight one peed this time, and you don't want to go down at the first space. You want to walk past it and then go down. You can avoid a guarded space that way. Down here, we're going to find all of the good treasures. But first, it looks like there's a few of these Paralisks we need to fight, and these guys only have 44 hit points, so it's not going to take much to take them out. They're weak against ice magic, so one shot of ice too should take out a lot of them. We can back that up by having our other caster also use ice too. These guys are dangerous. They use a squint attack, which can knock out your party members, but we do have some pro rings now, which can protect against that. There may be just a ton of treasure down here, but don't get too excited. It's essentially just all money and garbage equipment that we're going to take back to a store and sell. Over here, we meet another guarded space, and this one has Grey Worm. Ah, one of my favorite characters from the Game of Thrones. This guy is a lot less effective than that character would be. I'm glad that we don't have to fight him, because this guy is pretty easy. He's weak against ice magic, so we can use that to our advantage. But there's only one Grey Worm here for us to fight, so just having everyone do an all-out melee attack should finish him off in no time. And with that, Vito reaches level 16, which is excellent. There's a bunch of treasure here, so just turn around and collect it all. And then we can just loop around the top and collect those last three chests that we couldn't pick up before. Oh, looks like we're out of item space, as we predicted before. So we'll need to throw something away. Probably one of these trash silver pieces that we don't need anymore. The silver gauntlet is worth more than the cap, though. So we can toss out a cap for now and just buy another one later. 
We'll pick up this silver shield, which we can redeem for a lot more money, as well as this silver axe that we'll also sell. And down here we'll find that last treasure chest, which only contains a heal potion. And once you have everything on this floor, we can try out that warp magic. You can't get the warp magic until you've been promoted, and I think they did that just to make sure that you can't easily escape the Castle of Ordeal. Well, once we're outside, we'll jump back into our airship, and we'll fly over to a city like Conaria, where we can unload all this junk. Even if we had gone to the volcano all the way back when we got the canoe, we still wouldn't have been very interested in keeping any of this gear. This is stuff we could have purchased before we went to the Earth Cave. Do you think we'd really want it in the volcano? No. No, I think we can do a little bit better than that. We're going to sell off the Giant Sword and the Silver Axe, two things that we won't need. But make sure to keep any items around that have magical properties. Before we go, we can take another stop at our favorite inn, which has surprisingly clean rooms for a place that advertises hourly rates. Before we head back to the volcano, there is one more place we wanted to stop at. The town of Gaia had a lot of very expensive equipment that we wanted to purchase, but we didn't have that much money before. Now that we sold all that loot from the Gurgu volcano, we can at least afford another gold bracelet. So we're going to pop back in here and purchase one of those for beat. With 24 absorb and almost no evade penalty, the gold bracelet is expensive, but it's arguably better than some heavier pieces of armor. This is going to be a very good upgrade for our master to use, so we're going to want to purchase one for him. If you can afford it, you may want to purchase one for the red wizard as well, but we probably don't have enough money for that. You'll certainly want to prioritize getting everybody a pro ring first, because pro rings are the very best gauntlet anyone can use. The gold bracelet is probably the best piece of armor you can buy in a store though. You will eventually find an opal bracelet, which is a unique piece of armor that's hidden in a dungeon, and there's better pieces of armor for the knight to use. But for now, the gold bracelet is pretty awesome. One more thing before we head out, we'll quickly stop over here in Elfland and we can replace that cap that we had to throw away, although this is certainly not something that's mandatory. At this point, I'm thinking we may want to move Beat into his rightful place in the party, which is in the second slot. So let's equip that cap on Beat. And we'll just press the select button and restore the proper order. You can beat Veto Game. Things are finally right once again. Well, that's all we really had to do here, so enough procrastination. It's time to jump in our airship and go back to the Gurgu Volcano. Oh, seriously? I guess first we're gonna fight three creeps and an ogre. Maybe we could have parked the airship a little bit closer to town? Oh well, these guys are easy. <laughs> One of them ran away. Yeah, get out of here, creep and Ogre hung around so we could take him out. Alright. Well, those guys used to be kind of tough, but not anymore. And Yu Can has been promoted to level 16. We're getting pretty powerful now. Let's make our way over to the volcano. And drop back in. Do a little super fast motion. When you get over here to floor 2, if you just go straight across the bottom, you can quickly get to the third floor, so that's what we're going to do. And here we are in floor three. Remember, whenever you walk on the lava, it'll deal you a little bit of damage, but you won't hit any monster encounters, so you may actually want to actively try to walk on the lava. Or I suppose that since we're inside the volcano, it's magma? Eh, uh, whatever, you know what I'm talking about. So fire walk with me down to these stairs and we'll be back to this part of floor three floor three has two parts so you need to go through floor three part a back up to floor four 
and then you come down here to floor three again. This guy, Cerebus, doesn't look very imposing, but he can do a magical attack that will deal damage to the entire party, which is why I used the heal staff to potentially counter it, but that's only really an effective strategy if the Cerebus would have used his attack first. In any case, our melee attacks quickly took that guy out, so he wasn't a problem anyway. We're going to make our way down here, and then cut across to the left a bit, and then down to the bottom. That's where the stairs to the next area are, and there's no treasure on this floor, so don't worry about finding any chests. Remember, if you stay on the lava, you won't meet any enemies. Now, as opposed to the previous floor, there's a lot of treasure on this floor, and a couple good items at that. We'll want to continue our strategy of scaring the enemies away by showing them how hardcore we are by walking in the lava, although you do want to be careful to maintain your hit points with some heal potions here and there. The lava will never kill you, but it could potentially reduce your hit points down to one, and if you enter a battle with one hit point, well, the enemies will feast on your body. Yeah, it will not be good. Up here, there's a pretty nice treasure room, and we can find a second ice sword, which is awesome. We can give that to the red mage who was using the substandard flame sword. You might think that the ice sword would deal extra damage to all the fire enemies in here. It doesn't, but it just deals a lot more damage in general, so it is the best weapon that either character, the knight or the red mage, could be using at this point in the game. Up here we'll find a flame shield, which is nice. It's good against ice attacks, and we won't be encountering a lot of those in here. So it might be better to use an ice shield. But we have it just in case we need it now. Down here we'll face another one of those gray worms. Miss Sandy will not be happy that we killed it off so quickly. But once he's dealt with, we want to head down to the bottom where there's a few more treasures and then there's the way to floor 5. Floor 5 is where the boss is. We took a decent beating from the lava here, so we'll need to use a few of our heal potions. And whenever we head up into this room, we want to hug the left wall again. That treasure chest only has 10 gold in it, so you can skip that one if you don't really feel like getting every treasure in the game. And you want to stay down at the bottom to get this one, which also has a very meager amount of gold in it. However, if we head up over here to the right, we can find a little bit of better stuff. 2,000 gold, I mean, that's not the worst. And a house is pretty decent too. This one is empty, so, well, we opened it for no reason, but wanted to show you that there wasn't anything in there. Make your way down to the bottom, and we're going to head over to the right where the final treasure room on this floor lies. And we'll use a few more heal potions to recover our health from all that lava we walked on. <laughs> Should've got some better shoes or something. Up here there's a guarded space in front of this chest, and this Agama can use a heat spell which is another one of those magics that just deals damage to our entire party. So in anticipation of that we can use our heal staff. It's always better when the Agama does his heat attack first and then the heal staff just kind of counters it, but it doesn't always work out that way. So, in any case, a few melee attacks should easily finish off that guy. And inside we get a wooden staff. Cool. Floor 5 is a very large area and it's the base of the volcano. There are several treasure chests on floor 5, but all of them are empty, except for one. This chest over here on the far left contains this floor's only treasure. Unfortunately, this treasure chest is hidden behind not one, but two guarded spaces. The first one is this Agama, and you'll actually have to go through him twice to be able to collect the chest. The second guarded space is a bit more interesting. It's a red dragon, which is a rare enemy on this floor. The red dragon is kind of dangerous, although it can be defeated with the Bane spell. 
defeating it with the Bane spell is a bit of a dice roll, it doesn't always work. The Ice spell, though, is always effective. If you don't have any Ice 2 magic left, though, you may want to try Bane if one of your characters has it. But in this case, it's pretty easy to take out the Red Dragon with just a couple Ice Shots. We won't actually need Ice Magic for the boss here, so don't worry about saving it for her. The Flame Armor is quite good. It has the same Absorb as the Steel Armor, but it has a lower Evasion penalty and will provide some protection against Ice Attacks. Up here we face that Agama again. And whenever this Agama is defeated, it looks like game has been promoted to level 17. So that's nice right before we face the boss. The boss, Carrie, is located in the lower left corner. But it seems before we go down there, we're gonna have to face a few more green ogres and their wizard buddy. We'll use a bit of magic here because there's not going to be very many more battles after this. So we might as well just leave it all out on the battlefield. That should take out the wizard ogre. And yep, he's gone. And it shouldn't take much more to take out that last green ogre either. Yep, that'll do it. Alright, now if there won't be any more interruptions here, we can get on to the boss. But it is nice to see that Beat was also promoted to level 17. We'll walk straight down this channel of lava and make our way to the lower left corner. Inside, we'll find the Fiend's Orb. Before we actually touch it, we're going to want to heal everybody up to full health. It's time to face another fiend. Is it you, the tinder that defeated the fiend of earth and disturbed my sleep? I, carry will now show you the force of fire, and you shall burn in the flames. Carrie is inspired by the Merolith enemies from Dungeons and Dragons, and she's resistant to pretty much all of our damage dealing magic. So what we need to do is focus on our melee attacks, and that's why we want to have our casters use fast on both the knight and the master in the first round of combat. After that though, Carrie does have a weakness to status magic, and the hold spell is particularly good against her. If you can land it, it has about a 33% chance of success. Then she'll be paralyzed and she won't be able to do anything, making this battle trivial. So I would just keep trying to use hold on the black mage until you get it. And well, okay, we got it, attack halted. And once Carrie is frozen, well, just keep up the beatdown and she'll go down quite quickly. It shouldn't take too many attacks with fast on your melee attackers to finish her off. Even if you never do get hold to land, it still isn't that hard to defeat Carrie. And with that, the orb of fire is restored. It's time to head back to Canaria for a much needed rest. And to sell off some items we don't need. With two fiends down and only two to go, the next orb we want to take care of is the orb of water. Before we do that though, things got so hot there in the Gurgu volcano that I think that we may need to cool off by heading back over to the ice cave. In reality, there's a number of treasure chests that we didn't collect when we were in the ice cave, and we're going to need a ton of money to be able to get into the sea shrine where the Fiend of Water lives. The amount of money we actually need is 50,000, so we do technically have enough gold right now, but 50,000 is just the price of admission. We also need to purchase some better items and equipment, and definitely some more spells before we go down there. So it does make sense to make this pit stop over at the ice cave and get the rest of the treasure out of there. Before we get it though, make sure to restock your supply of heal potions. 99 heal potions please! Sir, sir, I told you. I am not doing math in this store. Math is the dip. Alright, fine, alright. Jeez, man, okay, no math, gotcha. Once we're out of Canaria, 
If we want to head back to Crescent Island, we can actually use level 6 magic on our Black Mage now, so we at least want to pick up the Lit 3 spell, which is the most powerful version of Lit. It's similar to Lit 2 in that it hits all the enemies, it's just going to hit them for even more damage. That's all. Just the same good old Lit, just a little bit brighter. Yeah, these spells are not cheap. It looks like it's 620,000 gold, but it just says level 6, 20,000 gold. The whole thing is just kind of run together. So you don't need that much money to buy it, but 20,000 is not nothing. That's the price of a pro ring. We can also stop up here at Gaia and pick up a few more pieces of equipment here. If you remember from our first trip to the Ice Cave, one of the biggest problems was enemies that used the Rub spell against us, which can instantly KO our party members. Using Pro Rings will be protected against that, so now whenever they use that Rub spell, it will simply say, Ineffective. It will not protect you from the Sorcerers who add a Rub effect onto their attack though, so beware of those guys. Now that our red mage can cast life magic, he's a lot more valuable, so it's very important that we get a pro ring for him. If you have the money, buy one for your knight as well, but he can use better armor, so he's the lowest priority for receiving a pro ring at this point. Still, the pro rings are the very best gauntlet in the entire game for any character class, so eventually you're going to want four of them. We'll just fly south here, and here it is. The ice cave was a very dangerous place before, and it's still dangerous now, but we're a lot more powerful this time. Unfortunately, there's no way to buy pro rings before getting the airship, so there's no way to bring them here on your first trip. It certainly makes things a lot safer to have that piece of equipment, although yeah, definitely be careful of those sorcerer guys who can still knock your people out. Use fire magic fairly liberally this time. We don't have to stay in here quite as long as we did the previous times. We're just going to get some treasure and get out. And we also have access to warp magic now, which is nice. Up here, we'll face some mages. And these guys can use rub magic. Behind this guarded space is a piece of cloth armor. A complete garbage item. This is why I recommended we didn't head over to this area before. Fighting these enemies without pro rings is completely irresponsible, and doing it to get cloth armor is just stupid. So it's certainly something that you don't want to do on your first trip into the ice game. You'll notice that these guys don't have any specific elemental vulnerabilities, so it's a good time to make some use out of your ice magic whenever you're facing them. With them dead, we can finally pick up this stupid treasure chest, and then we'll drop into one of these holes to head down to floor B3B, where we'll face off with our good old familiar undead battle. We've fought battles on this space several times now, but this is the first time that we've gotten the full complement of 9 undead. Definitely take these guys seriously. As usual, they can all paralyze your people, so you'll want to use your higher level fire magic against them, or at least fire too. We still have that Zeus gauntlet as well, so get that in the mix, and we should be able to clear out any number of undead with ease. With those monsters cleaned out, it looks like Vito has been promoted to level 17. Excellent! Now we're going to head over to the left and pick up that ice armor that we didn't get before. The ice armor would have been nice to have in the volcano, but you'll see why we didn't try to get it before. It's guarded by some frost dragons, and they're quite dangerous. They do a blizzard attack that just hits the entire party for a ton of damage. And we got two frost dragons this time. You can possibly draw just one frost dragon. Two is fairly unlucky. We'll try our A ice magic. I don't like this kind of magic because sometimes the enemies get to do their attack before the red mage ends up casting A ice. This time it actually worked out great. Vito got his turn and cast A ice before the frost dragons cast blizzard, and then when the blizzard hit we took a lot less damage. I'd consider this more of the exception than the rule. It doesn't always work out that way. 
Now that our party is a lot more powerful than it was the first time we came through the ice cave, the frost dragons are not quite as big of a deal, but they still do a decent amount of damage with that blizzard attack, so they need to be taken seriously. Once you have the ice armor, you can avoid stepping to the left and collecting this second item, which is just a silver gauntlet. It's nothing very good, and it forces you to have to fight the frost dragons again. So if you don't feel the need to get every single treasure chest in the game, you can avoid that one, and it's probably a good idea to skip it. Once those frost dragons are defeated the second time, make sure everybody's healed up, and we'll head down onto this snow patch, which works a lot like the lava did in the volcano, so you won't meet any encounters when you're walking on it. The ice armor is pretty nice, it's just the same as the flame armor, except this protects against fire attacks, so whenever you're fighting fire-based monsters, you may want to switch over to it if you know that's what's coming up. And down here there's one more treasure room in this place that's worth visiting, and this one just has a whole bunch of money in it. If you stay along the bottom here, you can avoid a guarded space and get most of the money. But if you go all the way to the right in the middle of the chests, you will have to face some frost wolves. We faced frost wolves before, and this isn't that many of them, although you may have to face like an entire screen of frost wolves up here. And they can do a frost attack that hits our entire team, so they can be dangerous in high numbers. Make sure to use your good fire attacks, and you should be able to clear them off quickly, but sometimes they just get to go before you, especially if they ambush your party and get to attack first. That can be a complete disaster. So grabbing this treasure chest up here for just a measly 180 gold, it's really just greedy. You're better off avoiding it. And we'll just switch back to fast motion here as we make our way to the stairs over on the right side. There was one treasure chest in the bottom here that we didn't pick up the last time, and this one contains a ton of money in it, so we do not want to miss it this time. That's right, 10,000 gold. Once you have that though, you can either warp out of there or just take the stairs over on the right. It's pretty easy to get out from here. Back here in Gaia, we can sell off some of the items that we found over in the ice cave. And we can also buy another gold bracelet so that three of our characters can wear it. Right now I think we'll be content with the knight wearing the ice armor. With the Zeus gauntlet that protects from lightning and the flame shield that protects from fire, he's nice and well rounded right now. But that's not the only reason why we came here to Gaia. This place has a fairy spring, and the fairy can provide us a very important key item called Oxyale. Oxyale works sort of like a liquid oxygen, or maybe more accurately like the gillyweed in Harry Potter, but it will allow us to breathe underwater, magically. The problem is, the fairy is not currently in the fairy spring, because something kinda bad happened to her. And by something bad happened to her, I mean, this pirate put her in a bottle and sold her to a caravan. Yeah, a little bit of fairy trafficking going on in this game. So where is this caravan? Well, the caravan is over on a stretch of desert that doesn't have a whole lot of other markings on it. If we head over to the right, we can just come right down here and park our airship in this patch of grass. Then we're going to need to walk through a fairly dangerous desert where we could be attacked by some mean enemies. These saber tea and tigers are really not them. These guys are actually pretty easy. A little bit of magic should take these guys out quite quickly. It's the Anklos that show up in this area that you have to worry about. Those guys can be pretty mean, they have a decent magic defense, and annoyingly, don't give you any money when you kill them. Well, they give you like one gold. Thanks. So you'd rather not meet up with those guys. These though? We can meet up with these all day. 
You definitely want to make sure that you have 50,000 gold before coming over here, or it is going to be a problem. This guy is not going to sell it to you for less than that. We have 71,000, so it's no problem. But this guy has only one item, the bottle. And that's a very important key item that we're going to need to get that Oxy Ale. And here's that Anklo enemy I was talking about. This guy can be pretty mean. We'll use our most powerful magic to try to get through his magic defenses and attack him with our melee characters. He has 352 hit points, so we have a good bit to chip through. Lightning 3 got him pretty good, and our knight was able to finish him off. But you can see, yeah, one gold. Thanks, man. Get some money, Anklos. Once you have the bottle, you can use it from the item menu at any time, and it will make the fairy appear at the spring. But you might as well just use it when you're standing over in the spring. That's what I always do. So we're going to make our way to the upper right corner of Gaia. To get up there, we need to head all the way over to the left, and that's where we'll find a path that takes us up to the top of the city, and then we can double back to the right where we'll find that fairy spring. So we're going to head up this way past where we saw that pirate, and then we're going to cut over to the right. So right past the pirate, and the fairy spring is going to be over here. So there's a nice little path through these trees, and we'll head right around them. Just some happy little trees. And up here, we'll find that fairy spring. So let's release that fairy. No more fairy trafficking for us. And she's so grateful that just by talking to her, we'll get that oxy ale. All right. Now that we have it, we can finally enter the sea shrine. So thanks a lot for the oxy ale and try not to get kidnapped by pirates again. I definitely do not have money to keep bailing you out, fairy. With the Oxy Ale obtained, we're going to head over to the right, and when you see this waterfall, you can follow this river down. That's the city that we're looking for, the city of Onrak, but we can't land the airship too close to it. This is the best spot near the end of this river, which we can canoe down. The enemies in these rivers are a bit more dangerous than the ones over by the ice cave, but our Zeus Gauntlet and our Lit Magics will still be very effective. So make sure to use them and use your Lit 2 or even Lit 3. There is an inn in the next city, so you can use whatever magic you want to take care of the enemies around here. The Frost Gators can actually hit pretty hard, so they're the priority target in this set. The Red Karibs won't actually deal quite as much damage, so you can ignore them until the Frost Gators are defeated. For the most part though, you want to be using magic spells that hit all of the enemies, so it doesn't matter that much. Now we can just split our attacks between the last two enemies and also use that Zeus Gauntlet, and these guys should go down no problem. Well I hope everyone wants the catch of the day because we fried those fish. And with that, Beat is promoted to level 18, and Game reaches level 18 as well. We'll make our way to the right and follow the river. This time it's a Naocho, or a Nacho. In any case, this guy has 344 hit points, which is quite a bit, but he's just one single enemy, so an all-out attack should take him down pretty fast. He can poison us, but at this point in the game, like, really, poison? Come on now. Three hits, 80 damage, and this guy is out of there. We should hopefully be able to make it up to the city of Onrak without any more interruptions, and be aware that this is not a full featured town. There is an item shop here, and there is an inn, so that's something. And there's a clinic, so I guess in some ways it's better than Melmond. But there's no armor shop, and there's no weapon shop, so if you find a bunch of items that you want to sell, you will not be able to sell them here. This old man tells us about the fate of the Sea Shrine. 200 years ago, in a fiery explosion, it sunk to the bottom of the ocean. I'm assuming since mermaids were living inside of it, that part of it was always submerged, but I think that maybe the top 
three or so floors must have been above water. Still, it's not good for those mermaids, although they can at least breathe under the sea, so maybe they're okay? In any case, we're going to need to go down there and find out. This woman over here is surprised to find out we have legs. Yeah, so does everybody else here, lady. What is the shock about that? This woman tells us that her father runs that caravan out in the desert. Well, I'd like to tell you, lady, that your father is now a very rich man. We gave him 50,000 gold pieces for that stupid bottle. This woman tells us about a very important key item that we're going to find down in the sea shrine called the slab. And this guy, Dr. Un's brother, tells us a little bit more about it. Using the slab, Dr. Un will be able to teach us the language of the people of Leafine, and then we'll finally be able to talk to them. If we would go to that city right now, they would just say Lupa Lupa to us, and we wouldn't be able to get anywhere. So we certainly need to find that slab in the sea shrine before we can go down to Leafine. And we're going to make our way to the right following this path. Over here, there's a few more people, including this guy named Cope, who says he thinks he saw a robot. A robot may sound out of place in this game, but Final Fantasy has always had a little bit of science fiction blended in, and it does so even here in the first game. If you have the Oxy Ale, this woman will disappear when you talk to her, and will be able to enter the submarine, and proceed on to Chapter 6, The Sea Shrine. The Sea Shrine is an absolutely massive dungeon, but it splits into two paths at the very beginning here, so we can attack it in two separate trips. Here we meet our first battle against a Naga and a Water Elemental. Anytime we face a Water Elemental, that means we're not going to be able to run away. And the Nagas are pretty dangerous as well. They often will use Lit 2 as their first magic spell, which will deal decent damage to our entire team. It's kind of surprising that they cast a Lit Magic, considering that they're vulnerable to it. Although Water Elementals are not vulnerable to Lightning Magic, and are actually weak against ice, which makes a good bit of sense. They'll be like frozen into ice cubes, which certainly would be bad for a water elemental. We are likely to take a lot of damage in battles in this area, so that's why we needed to bring 99 potions. Whenever we take a hit from a spell like Lit 2, that may require 4 or even 5 potions to fix. Over here on the left side, we can grab this treasure box that contains 9,900 gold. And here's a pretty big fight. You cannot run against these guys, although we've fought red sahags before and they're not that big of a deal. It's the wizard one that's dangerous. We just want to use our lightning magic and of course the Zeus gauntlet, and that's going to take these guys out with no problem. So Lit 2 should finish off pretty much all of the Red Zahags in one move. We know that from fighting them on the ocean, although rarely in these large numbers. And it's the Wizard that we just have to worry about. A few more Lit Blasts should take him out though, and the Zoops Gauntlet finish the battle. So if you ever see that one, that one is not a battle to panic about. It looks intimidating with all the enemies on the screen, but they're mostly pretty soft ones. Once we have that chest, we're going to head back over here to the top right, and we run into a Gray Shark. Gray Sharks have 344 hit points, and they do 50 to 100 points of damage when they attack. The regular Shark is pretty weak, so you don't have to worry about him too much. Focus your attacks on the Gray Shark and take him out, and the regular Shark should be easy to finish off afterwards. Certainly use your Zeus Gauntlets again, because that's going to deal a lot of damage to both targets, but make sure that any melee attackers are focusing their attacks on the Gray Shark. Now it actually says GR Shark, and I always kind of thought it was Great Shark, or like, you know, like Great White Shark, but now that I've heard the song, it's hard for me to not think of him as Grandpa Shark. It is what it is. 
there are a couple very good treasure chests on this floor, so make your way down and to the left. These ghosts are not your standard undead. They don't do the stun thing, making them a lot less dangerous than your typical undead monsters. You'll still want to use your fire magic against them, but it's not as big of a thing this time. Take them out with whatever you have, use your Zeus gauntlet so you can hit multiple enemies as we have been doing for quite some time now, and these guys should be pretty easy to beat. They do hit hard when they hit you though, so be aware that a large group of those guys could be a little bit more dangerous than you might think. The way to the next floor is located in the lower right corner, so to get all of the treasure chests we're going to cut across the top to the left and we'll find a way to get to the very top over here. We'll heal up after that last battle, make sure everybody's in good shape, and here's the path we were looking for that will take us up and then we'll bear right a bit, where we'll find a doorway and a treasure room that includes that opal armor. The opal armor has 42 absorb, which is quite a big upgrade, so we definitely want to grab that. Now our knight really has a lot of absorbs, so it should be difficult for enemies to penetrate him with damage. And this time we need to fight two grandpa sharks. So get in there with some lightning magics. I'm going to even try lightning three this time, we'll see if they last long enough. Once we get through this floor, we're not going to have to face any enemies after that and we'll be able to use our warp magic to escape. So, we can just kind of use whatever magic we want in here, we don't have to be that conservative on this first trip. And with that, you can reach his level 18. As does Vito, we are getting very powerful. Use a couple heal potions. And we're going to follow this path down, and we're going to go back into the right where there's this building that's shaped like a backward C. It actually mirrors the shape of Crescent Lake a little bit. And inside we'll find a measly 20 gold, so if you want to skip that treasure chest, feel free. Remember that you can't run from these guys, but you won't need to. A little bit of lit magic and the Zeus gauntlets will take them right out. We're going to head down to the bottom, and only two ghosts this time. Well, we're not being haunted that heavily by those guys. We'll just head down to the bottom, and over here on the bottom left, we'll find a pretty nice item. This is the Light Axe. The Light Axe is not something that we're going to equip and use as an actual weapon, but we can use it as an item in battle, and it casts the spell of Harm 2 for free. So that's going to be a very effective way for us to deal with Undead moving forward. We're going to have somebody use that Light Axe to cast Harm 2 for free. Sea snakes are vulnerable to lit, and they don't poison you as you might think that they would, but they do have a decent amount of hit points. 224 is a lot more than you might think a small enemy like this would have. So take them fairly seriously, use one round of lit against them, and then finish whoever's left with melee attacks. Over here in this room, we can find another great item. This is the Mage Staff. The Mage Staff, when used as an item in battle, casts the spell of Fire 2. So now we have items that can cast Fire 2, Lit 2, and Harm 2, so that's a pretty nice variety. If we distribute them to our characters, we can actually get a lot of free magic going, so we definitely want to do that. Make sure whoever has the Mage Staff also doesn't have the Light Axe, because those two are kind of redundant whenever we're fighting undead enemies. And we got the Wiz Sahag and the R Sahags again, and we're almost to the stairway, so once you get in here, you're in the clear. There are no enemies on this floor. It seems that the mermaids are all okay, and they're doing fine here under the sea. The seaweed is always greener in somebody else's lake. That mermaid tells us that they'll become bubbles if we don't regain the power of water, which is an allusion to the original Hans Christian Andersen Little Mermaid story. 
In this treasure chest, we can find a very important piece of armor, the Opal Bracelet. The Opal Bracelet is the best bracelet in the game. With 10 more absorbed than the gold bracelet, you'll be very happy to find it, but sadly, it's the only one in the game. This mermaid tells us about her friend named Daryl, which seems like kind of a funny name for a mermaid, but hey, whatever. She seems to have escaped and grew legs. Hmm. A definite allusion to the Little Mermaid story. There's a lot of that going on. We want to head up and make our way to the left across this long hallway, which will actually wrap us around to the right side of the map. Pretty weird, but, you know, it's just one more piece of proof that Final Fantasy is not flat. Over here, we'll find another piece of armor. We can drop something like a cap to make room for it, since we know that caps are fairly inexpensive. We might as well just drop a few of them, since we are going to have to pick up a few pieces of armor here. The Opal Helmet is a pretty good one, and then there's the Opal Gauntlet, which is actually pretty disappointing. In the right box, there's the slab, and the slab is a key item and the one thing that we needed to find up here. We can switch the Zeus gauntlet around and maybe try out some different configurations here. But unfortunately, we just don't really need that opal gauntlet, although we can wear it. It has the same amount of absorb as a pro ring, but it has more evade penalty, which is bad, and it does not provide the protection against rub magic, so pro ring is just the superior option. If you don't have money to buy a fourth pro ring, you can use an opal gauntlet for a while, but you're definitely going to want to sell that off and upgrade to the pro ring sooner or later. Once we have that, there's a few more treasures and a few more mer people to talk to here. So we'll make our way around the rooms and make sure that we hit them all. Up here, she wants us to make the orb shine again. Yeah, we want that too. That's kind of the point of the game here. That's what we're doing. And we can find some more money. It cost us a lot of money to get down here, but we're going to make that money right back with all the treasure and stuff that we find. This one has 5,000 more gold pieces, which is excellent. We almost have everything now, but there is a few more treasure boxes down in the lower right corner. This mermaid has a good tip. She tells us that the Fiend of Water is on floor number one. So that's kind of useful. Down here we can find a Pure Potion, which we don't really care. And this mermaid tells us how to get into the Mirage Tower. We need to get a special tone from the people of the town of Leafine. So that's why we needed to find this slab. The slab is sort of like the Rosetta Stone for the Leafinish language. There's one more piece of armor down here in the lower right corner. And this one's the opal shield, so you definitely don't want to miss that. It's a nice shield that our knight can use. Once we have everything, we still don't have the exit magic spell, so the best way to get out of here is going to be walking all the way back to the stairs. You can see now how much more powerful our characters are though. This was a great haul of loot. If you don't want to use too many warp spells, walking over to the stairs is the best way to go. It's totally safe because there's no enemies on this floor, and it will save us one use of the warp spell. One thing that's kind of strange about using warp magic here, is if we did have the exit spell, Casting Exit actually takes us to the space right outside of town, while casting several uses of the Warp Magic will actually take us right back to the submarine within Onrak. You would think it would maybe work the same, but it doesn't. Because Onrak doesn't have a weapon or armor store, we're going to have to go all the way to another town to be able to sell off a lot of the things that we found here. We definitely want to make room in our inventory because there's even more good stuff in the rest of the sea shrine, so we need to make some space for it. 
The other thing that I don't like about OnRack is its item shop. While it does have a lot of great things to purchase, they're in the wrong order. You want the heal potions to be at the very top of the list so that you can buy them more quickly, since it already takes such a long time to buy 99 heal potions. It's probably worth your time to actually go to another city and buy heal potions there, because it would be a lot faster. The solution to our problems is Canaria Town, as it always is. There's a nice weapon store in here where we can sell off weapons, there's an armor store where we can sell off extra pieces of armor, and there's also an item store that has heal potions at the very top of the list, so we can purchase them quickly by just mashing the button, or if you have it, by using a turbo controller. A turbo controller will save you a little bit of hassle. While we're here, we can also use magic with our knight now, so we might as well buy him a whole bunch of white magic to use. Having another character that can throw out a few more cure magics isn't the worst thing to have. One other level 1 spell that you want to make sure to pick up for your knight is Ruse. That's a spell that we are definitely going to cast, so make sure that you pick that one up when you're in Canaria Town. At this point, we can go and get the other magic spells for our knight, so here in Provoca, we can pick up level 2 white magic. Level 2 white magic isn't very good, so you can skip it if you want to, but maybe, just maybe, you would cast Invis at some point, so make sure to get that one. But beyond that, you'll want to pick up A Lit and Mute. Those are slightly more useful than Lamp, which cures darkness. It's probably something you would never, ever cast. Down here in Elfland, we can get level 3 magic for our knight, and that includes Cure 2, which is pretty good. He can't use Heal or Harm 2, so that only leaves one other spell to buy, so pick up a Fire if you want to. It's certainly not mandatory. Before we leave Elfland, there is a neat little Easter egg that I want to show you right here near the White Magic Shop. Usually whenever you touch a tomb here in Final Fantasy and press the A button, it just says, this is a tomb. But this one is special. It says, here lies Erdrick, the hero from Dragon Warrior. Well, it's certainly not canon that Erdrick from Dragon Quest came to the world of Final Fantasy where he died and was buried in the city of Elfland. It is a nice little nod to the series. One thing that I do wonder is if this actually exists in the Japanese version as well, or if it's something that was added by the English translation team. So if you've played the Japanese version of Final Fantasy and you know if this easter egg is in there or not, let me know down in the comments. Before we go, we can round out our equipment and pick up a few extra caps that we had to throw away, although we'll hopefully be replacing those soon. The best helmet in the game is an item called the Ribbon, and we're going to be able to find one in our next trip to the Sunken Shrine. Before we head over there though, we do want to purchase more of those heal potions because it's pretty annoying to buy them in the city of Onrak, so make sure that you have 99 and it might be a good idea to pick up more pure potions while you're at it. Once you have everything you need, we're going to make one more pit stop over in Gaia before we head back to Onrak. So we can hop back into our airship and fly on over to Gaia. Considering how much money we have now, it's a bit of a crime that we don't have the fourth pro ring yet, so it's about time that we go purchase that. But we also have enough cash that we can afford a bit more frivolous things, so we can also pick up the Cat Claw for our Black Wizard to use. The Cat Claw sounds like it would be some kind of Freddy Krueger glove thing, but in actuality, it's just a big dagger. Still, it deals a good bit of damage for a wizard weapon, so it's certainly something that you'll want to grab while you're here. We can certainly sell off this Flame Sword, I'm not sure why we're still carrying that around. And we can let go of this Silver Dagger, because the Cat Claw is going to be quite an upgrade over that. Cat Claws cost so much money that even level 8 magic costs less than this thing, so yeah, it's a bit of a frivolous purchase, but it is pretty powerful. 
Hopefully our black wizard won't be making a ton of melee attacks, but every once in a while we just do everybody all out attacks, so it'll be nice for him to be able to deal a bit more damage in that situation. With the cat claw in our possession, we can finally make our way back to Onrak. Remember, you can't land your airship right near Onrak, you want to land it down near the river and use your canoe to get up here. And we could save at the inn, it's probably a good idea to do that before we head on back into the Sunken Shrine. The next part of the Sunken Shrine is going to be a bit more difficult than the first trip, so we'll need to be more conservative with our magic this time. With our health and magic restored, it's time to make our way back to the submarine for the Sea Shrine Part 2. The last time we came through here, we took the stairs in the upper right, so this time we're going to want to take the stairs in the upper left. Before we do that though, we did skip one treasure chest over here on the right side, so we'll grab that first. If you've already picked this one up, you don't have to get it again, there won't be anything in there. This has 2,000 gold, so yeah, it's not nothing. We'll pick it up. And once again, we'll be assaulted by a Naga and the Water Elemental. Remember that waters are vulnerable to ice magic, not lit. So we'll just head back up here. Those battles are pretty easy to take care of. And one more before we go upstairs, but this is a new one. Sea Trolls and Lobsters. Now the Cobras in this game are not poisonous, but the Lobsters are. I remember my mom always telling me when we went to the beach as a kid to watch out for poisonous lobsters when we were swimming in the ocean. No, that, that never really happened. In any case, the lobsters and the sea trolls are both weak against lit magic, so our Zeus gauntlet is going to be very effective here. The lobsters are actually more threatening than the sea trolls since they bring the poison and they actually can hit pretty hard. You may want to prioritize those guys, but your magic will take them out anyway. And after that battle, Beat reaches level 19, Game also gets level 19, and Vito... Vito got poisoned. Yeah, sorry buddy. We're gonna have to give you a pure potion. Don't worry, we got you. We have all kind of pure potions here. Once everybody's all fixed up, I think that I'm going to switch the Mage Staff down to Vito. That way, if he wants to conserve some of his magic spells and not use them in combat, he could use the Mage Staff instead, and then our melee attackers can do more melee attacking, which is what they're best at anyway. Up here, we face the combination of Lobsters and Sea Snakes. Remember that the Lobsters are the poisonous ones here. While both of these enemy types are actually vulnerable to lightning magic, I used ice magic with the black wizard here just so that we could conserve some of our lightning spells for the battles ahead. Pretty much everything down here is going to be weak against lightning, so by using one ice 2 spell from the black wizard, the Zeus gauntlet, and the mage staff, we should be able to thin out the ranks of these enemies and then we can just divide up our melee attacks to finish them off. Even the Black Wizard attacking with the Cat Claw now should be able to do enough damage to finish off one of these enemies in a single blow. But the Knight will easily be able to do it, so that is no problem at all. With these guys defeated, we're going to make our way up to the top of this area. There's actually no treasure boxes in this floor, so we don't have to worry about collecting anything here. Just hug the right side, avoid the rooms, and make your way to the top where you'll find the stairs. Before we get up there though, we ran into a gray shark and a big eye. The big eyes are just an upgraded version of the odd eye enemies that we fought in the ocean so long ago. But with 304 hit points, they're not the pushovers that the odd eyes were. The big eye is definitely the priority target in this combination of enemies because it can stun your party members. So once the big eye is out of the way, you can focus your attacks on the gray shark and finish the battle. 
We hit these stairs and they take us to floor 3B, which is just a tiny little floor with two stairways on it. And then we just want to walk around floor 4B. There's nothing hidden in the room in the middle. Here on floor 3C, there are two treasure boxes, and they just contain a little bit of money, so you can ignore them if you want. It looks like we encountered the sea snakes again, and we're doing that same plan where we used an ice 2 spell instead of wasting our lit magic. There's going to be plenty of opportunities to use the lit magic, so we are saving it just a bit. And some more sea snakes. We just used a trash tier lit magic that time to get through those since there were so few of them. And here's an actual floor where we need to do stuff. Floor 2-B has a good bit of treasures on them and a number of them are guarded. In this room you want to stay along the bottom to avoid any guards and grab the money and go. The plan for this floor is to cut across to the lower left corner where we'll find some more treasures, and then we'll follow the left side up to another treasure room, make our way back towards the middle where we'll find even more items, and then we can head up to the top where we'll find the stairs out of here. But before we do any of that, it looks like we have to take out some more sea trolls and lobsters, so we'll use our Zeus gauntlet like we always do and we can even throw out a few spells to take these guys down. Lit 2 we've been conserving for a while, but using it should quickly clear up this party, especially when combined with our other items. Everybody can all out attack to finish off the last sea troll, and that single hit from the knight should do it. Nice work you can, keep that positive attitude going, because you just made it to level 19. And so did your buddy in red, Vito. Man, after Vito hit the class change, his outfit looks like he's been hanging out with Silky Johnston at the Player Haters Ball. I mean, he's really rubbing it in now. In this room, you need to come up here on the right side to be able to grab this chest. There's a guarded space on either side of it, but if you head down here, you'll only have to fight some water enemies, which is probably more desirable. Unfortunately, the power gauntlet that you get there is not very good in this version of the game. It can be used as an item to cast the Saber spell, which is good if you're playing one of the remake versions of Final Fantasy, but here on the NES, it's bugged and just like the Temper spell, does nothing. There's a guarded space on either side of this treasure box. I prefer this one on the upper side, where you'll fight a combination of Grey Sharks and Wizard Zahags, versus the one below the chest you'll fight a big screen full of sea snakes and lobsters and sea trolls. I think this one with the fewer enemies is a little bit better, but it's up to you. Either way, you'll have to fight something if you want to grab this treasure, which is a pretty good one. It's another one of those light axes, and if we distribute them out to our party, we'll be able to have two party members using a light axe and one of our party members using the mage staff whenever we fight a bunch of undead. That way we'll be able to easily clear an entire screen of undead without using any magic spells, although most of the time the black wizard can throw a few in anyway, but this way we'll be able to do it completely for free. This is another reason why you really don't need a white mage. A lot of the white mage's unique abilities can be used through items. Once you have the light axe, you want to make your way over to this other room on the right side, where we're going to find what is arguably the most important item down here. The ribbon. The ribbon is one of the best helmets in the game, if not the best. It may not provide the most absorb, but it provides magic defense against every single element type. All of them. So it's going to make your enemy's spells not hit you, so bad status stuff you'll be able to avoid, and it's also going to reduce damage from elemental damage spells. The ribbon is just great, and any character can wear it. It doesn't matter what class they are. So you definitely don't want to miss one of the three ribbons in the game, which is hidden right here. 
there are two more ribbons that we'll be able to find, and we're definitely going to want to pick those up. We will have to leave one character without a ribbon. That character will likely be our knight, who will be able to wear a very good helmet instead. But he won't be able to wear the ribbon, so he won't be able to take advantage of the extreme amount of magic defense that it provides. However, the other equipment he gets to wear will mostly make up for it, so that's why we usually have the other three characters wear the ribbon, and the knight will wear all the other good pieces of armor. For now, we have the red mage wearing our only ribbon. He's the only one that can cast life magic, so if he were to die, he wouldn't be able to revive anybody, and that's why he's the one that we really want to protect at this point in the game. Once you have all the treasures, you want to make your way to the stairway in the upper left corner, and that's going to take us to Floor 1. Floor 1 has no treasures on it. It's just the boss. The Kraken. So our job here on Floor 1 is to find the Fiend's Orb and release the Kraken. The Kraken's actually a pretty mean boss, so we need to be ready for this guy. He does a lot of attacking. Unlike the other fiends that cast a long list of magic spells, the Kraken actually favors strong physical attacks, which is a bit different. We're going to make our way around these small rooms, and here we've encountered another gray shark. This should be pretty easy, we've taken out a lot of these guys, and a simple all-out attack should quickly finish him off. With this guy out of the way, it looks like a few of our characters have reached level 20. Nice work, Beat! And game! Alright, well with the team up on level 20, we should have a pretty good chance against the Kraken. Our game plan is to cast Ruse on the Knight. The Ruse spell will increase the caster's evade by 80 points, which is just awesome. With all that extra evade, it's going to be very difficult for Kraken to kill the knight, and if he can't kill our knight, well then he can't defeat our party and will eventually win. Once you get up to the Fiend's Orb, make sure everybody is fully healed so that they can maybe survive one of Kraken's attacks, which would be awesome. We're also going to leave the Red Mage in the second slot because he's a little bit more expendable in this battle. The Fiend's Ball is shattered, evaporating all the water. Ho ho ho, how foolhardy it is to challenge me, Kraken, the Fiend of Water. Once we're in the battle, make sure the Knight uses that Ruse magic, and have our casters cast fast on both the Knight and the Master. That's going to give us the best chance of winning here. Hopefully the Kraken will use his Ink Attack, which is his least threatening maneuver. You'll see that it's fairly ineffective against our party, and it doesn't deal any damage. If he would have done an attack, well, that could have been much worse. He just got darkness on our black wizard. If your wizard's still alive, you can use Lit 3 on this round, but if he took an attack from the Kraken, he's probably dead. You can see how little damage the Kraken actually does when he attacks the knight, but if he attacks anyone else, he will deal severe damage and potentially kill them. Remember, we just need to deal enough damage to this guy to remove 800 hit points, and if all of our characters but the knight die, that's fine, because we're going to be able to teleport right out of here as soon as this battle is over. Lit 3 is fairly effective, dealing over 100 damage, and we did quite well this time. The Kraken is defeated, and the Orb of Water has been restored. We'll certainly want to go back into Onrak so that we can use the inn and heal up and save the game before we try to hike back to our airship. But now that the Water Fiend is defeated, that's three down and only one to go. The only fiend that remains is Tiamat, the Fiend of Wind. So that's our next objective. We've got to take her out. Tiamat lives in a floating castle, and despite having an airship, we can't just fly up there because it's in literal outer space. The key to getting up there is learning the Lefinish language, and to do that, we need to visit our old friend Dr. Un in Melmond. 
Before we talk to Dr. Un, though, it would be good for our red mage to be able to cast Fire 3, so we should buy that while we're here. And we can get slow, too, while we're at it. Once we have that magic purchased, you remember where Dr. Un lives. He's in the upper right corner. Now that we have the slab from the Sea Shrine, whenever we talk to him, he'll teach us the language of Lefinish. Considering that intelligence is not a priority in this game, it's very impressive that the members of our party can learn a brand new language in, like, less than a couple seconds. I mean, I took three years of German in high school and I definitely can't speak it. So, wow, these guys must be pretty smart. We can sell off that power gauntlet, since we won't be able to use it very effectively in this version of the game. Although if you were playing one of the other versions, the Saber spell is quite awesome in those ones. Our Black Mage can cast level 7 magic now, and they sell some good stuff up here in Gaia. Of course we want to get Ice 3, which is the best ice magic, but also make sure to buy the spell of Brack. Brack is an instant KO spell, but it has a very good chance of success, unlike most other instant KO spells. And it's one that we'll be able to use against a particular boss. To get to Lefine, it's going to be a bit of a hike. You want to park your airship over to the right of that large desert, and it looks like we have to fight two of these Anklo guys this time. Whew, this is not great. Let's try out that Brack magic. This could be a good opportunity to use it. We'll select the second Anklo and we'll focus most of our attacks on the top one and hope that this Brack works. And it did. It broke him to bits. It definitely doesn't work every time, but Brack works surprisingly often. It is a level 7 magic spell after all, so it should be fairly decent. Our other party members will quickly take care of that other Anklo, and then we can move forward. As we get closer to the city, You'll notice that the monster encounters change, and these are the same potential monster encounters that we were fighting in the secret level up zone all the way back at the beginning of the game. It's these encounters that got us here. So we should have no problem fighting these guys, although we don't have to reset the game if we meet a Tyro this time. You shouldn't have to fight too many monsters on the path to Lefine, but be aware that when you get to the city, there is not an inn there. So if you want to restore your magic, you're going to need to use a house. Of course, we do have several houses available to us at this point, so if you need a house, it's not that big of a deal. Vito reaches level 20, which is excellent. Now that he's reached level 20, he'll finally be able to use the Exit Magic spell, so we'll definitely want to pick that up after this. It looks like we've met with two giants. Oh no. Let's let the Red Mage get in there with Fire 3, and what the heck, we'll use Lit 3 too, because we can. All this powerful magic should easily take care of these guys, but don't underestimate our melee attackers who can easily finish off a giant in a single swing. Beat should be able to do this. Yep, no problem. And with those guys taken care of, it looks like you can has also reached level 20. Alright, level 20 is very good. We'll probably only need to be about level 25 to beat the game, so we're getting very close to the end. If you didn't bring the slab to Dr. Un before coming here, this will definitely be a wasted trip. But if you did, well, we're going to learn some very interesting stuff here in the town of Lefine. It seems that the legend is true. Many of the people that lived here have been spreading the legend about the Light Warriors, and perhaps that's where Lukon heard it from. If we walk around here, we find out that these people once had a very advanced civilization and were able to control the power of wind. It's quite possible that they're the ones that also built our airship, although we don't have to let them know that. If we head over here, it seems that they also constructed that floating castle that we need to reach, but sadly Tiamat has taken it over, and now they've all retreated here to their home on the ground. 
When we were in the city of Onrak, we met someone named Cope that said he saw a robot. The people here seem to have made robots, so maybe it was one of theirs? Hmm. We'll need to head over to the right side of town, and oh yeah, we definitely talked to this guy already. Well, we'll talk to him again. The Light Warriors, the legend is true. We need to head over here because this is where we're going to find the chime. The secret to getting into the floating castle is to go to a place called the Mirage Tower, but to get inside the Mirage Tower, we need this chime. To find it, we simply need to speak to a person down here at the bottom. And that guy actually told us that five warriors were sent out originally to stop this problem, but they were transformed into bats. Hmm. We've seen a lot of bats around. I wonder if one of them was those guys? Once we have the chime, we can leave. And you can actually buy level 8 magic while you're in that town, and they sell the nuke spell there, but it costs 60,000 gold, and you can't cast it just yet. However, if you have just a ton of money, you probably should stop and buy it right now so you don't have to go back there later. One spell that you do need to buy though, and make sure to save 20,000 gold for this, is the Exit spell. We can purchase it over here in Crescent Lake. We also should pick up Lit 3 for our Red Mage to use, and while it would be nice to have Nuke this early in the game, we're not going to be able to cast it for a long time, and we can definitely walk back to the town of Lefine when that time comes. After buying all those magic spells, our money is fairly depleted, but luckily, the next place that we're going to, the Mirage Tower, has a ton of treasure boxes for us to open up, and a lot of money and items for us to find. So that's why we're heading there next. It looks like you're supposed to land the airship here, but you could land it there, or even better, right here. Then you just need to move left and up, so do equivalent amounts of each, and that'll get you over to the Mirage Tower. First though, it looks like we ran into a Tyro and a Wyvern, although on this desert we could potentially run into the most dangerous enemy in the overworld, which is the T-Rex, although there's only a 2% chance of that, so there's a good chance we'll never see a T-Rex. There was a time when Tyros would have been very difficult for us to fight because they're highly resistant to magic, and back when we were level 5, magic was our only game plan. Now we have melee attackers, so the Tyros aren't that big of a deal. Just make sure that your good melee guys focus their attacks on the Tyro, and you can use magic to finish off the Wyvern. If we have the Chime, we'll have no problem getting into the Mirage Tower over here, but if you've played the game before, you're probably thinking right now, hey wait, you can't get to the floating castle until you also have the cube. And that's true. So that's why we're just coming to the Mirage Tower right now to get some treasure boxes, and then we're going to leave and come back later with the cube. First off, we have a new battle. Two Nightmares and two Badman. This is the most common battle that we're going to find here, and we're going to be using our Ice 2 magic because Ice 2 is very effective against the Nightmare enemies, and we're going to want to focus our melee attackers on the Badman enemies because the Badmans are actually pretty resistant to magic, so you'll notice that our Ice 2 spell doesn't do quite as much damage to them, but they can be quickly defeated with a good attack from the Master or one from the Knight. With a 38% encounter rate, we're going to be seeing a lot of these guys here in the Mirage Tower, but luckily for us, they're easy. Well, with those guys defeated, we can focus on getting that loot. I hope you have a lot of spaces in your inventory because you're going to need it to get all this stuff. The Aegea Shield is one of the first pieces of premium gear that we found here in the Mirage Tower. The Opal Shield is nice, but the Aegea Shield, well, that's even better. The Aegea Shield provides the same amount of absorb as the Opal Shield, but it provides protection from poison, which will protect us from spells like Bane, 
Brack, and Gaze attacks that turn us to stone. We'll have a lot of equipment that will protect us from lightning, so we don't need the extra lightning resistance that the Opal Shield provides, and we'll be very happy to have the Aegeus Shield, especially considering that our Knight is the one character that won't get a ribbon. We also found the Vorpal, which is a pretty mediocre weapon that's supposed to have a very good critical hit rate, but it's not actually that impressive, so that's something that we'll be selling at the store. And we also found the Heal Helmet, which is not great as far as helmets are concerned, but if you use it in battle, it has the same effect that the Heal Staff has. The Heal Staff is a lot easier to carry because it's a weapon, so we'll probably end up selling the Heal Helmet, but it is a nice item to be able to have. Now you're probably thinking, that was a pretty good haul. And it was, but we're not done just yet, oh no. There's a whole second floor full of treasure chests that we want to get here in the Mirage Tower, so that's the next thing that we're going to do. But first it looks like we found some Catman enemies, and we remember these from the battle that we fought outside the Castle of Ordeal. Catman enemies are not really that dangerous, they can poison us, and they hit decently hard, but they're not as intimidating as their man-cat friends which can cast Fire 2 magic and Fire 2 magic hits our entire party, so that's a lot worse. We're just going to use our Zeus Gauntlet, a couple melee attacks, and some of our best magic spells, and we should be able to take these guys out pretty easily. Don't hold back on your magic here. We don't have to go very deep into the Mirage Tower to get all the treasures that we want to find here, so we shouldn't have to face too many battles, and we don't have to be very conservative with our magic spells. So that's why we're litting it rip with some Fire 3 here, and that seemed fairly effective. It's always a little bit surprising how not dangerous the enemies are here in the Mirage Tower. This is a fairly advanced area, and none of these guys are really that tough. At least not here on the first two floors. Whenever we get up into the floating castle, there's some mean enemies up there, but we're not going there just yet. We're just trying to get the loot here in the Mirage Tower. Down here at the bottom you'll find the exit, which will take us to the stairs, and it's really nice whenever we come back here, we can just do a short loop from stairway to stairway to get up to the second floor. We don't have to waste our time walking all the way across the first floor if we already got all the treasures. There are certainly some more dangerous potential enemies up on this floor, including a 2% encounter with Blue D, who is a very dangerous dragon enemy and is sort of a boss in the next area. But for now, we just want to hopefully not have to fight that guy and instead fight things like this Chimera, which can be defeated pretty easily. When there's only one like this, we can even try to use things like the Heal Helmet to restore a bit of health. Cremate is his main move, and because we used the Heal Helmet, it sort of cancelled out the Cremate, which deals damage to all of our people. And it's fire-based damage, so if you have any items that are protecting you from fire, they'll help out. After that battle though, two of our characters were promoted to level 21. So yeah, just a few more levels until we'll be strong enough to take on the final boss. This is very good. We want to weave our way into these pillars and make our way into the central room here. Now here's a good fight. We love a whole screen full of undead. We can use our two light axes, our mage staff, and maybe even use some fire three from the black wizard for good measure. These enemies can put our characters to sleep, which is somewhat dangerous, although it seems like characters wake up from sleep a lot faster than they wake up from paralysis, so it's not as bad, but it still takes them out of the action, which is not ideal. Luckily these guys are just not that tough, and you can see you can already woke up, it's just like sleep only takes them out for a short amount of time. You do have to wonder if it was a mistake to have the higher level undead use the sleep attacks, while it's the lower level ones that do the more dangerous paralysis attacks. 
Up here we find some guard enemies, and these guys actually have a pretty good defense against physical attacks, so you'll want to use magic against them, and the best kind of magic to use is actually lightning. Lightning seems to be very effective, so of course our Zeus Gauntlet is also good, but if you don't have Lightning 3, of course Fire 3 is pretty decent, so you might want to throw that out there as well. When there's only one left, everybody attacking should quickly finish him off, especially since he took a few rounds of magic anyway. But with 200 hit points and that solid defense, these guys can be pretty annoying if you have to fight them in large numbers. And here's that second treasure room, and it's nice that they laid out the chests in such a way that they're a lot easier to collect. It seems very un-video game to arrange the chests in such a user-friendly way. You can actually get between three of them and pick up three items. I mean, that's awesome. Now the dragon armor, this is something good. The dragon armor has the same kind of absorb as the opal armor, but it also provides additional resistances to fire and ice on top of the resistance that it provides to lightning. So yeah, that's the best armor in the game for our knight to use. And we're also going to find the sun sword here, which deals more damage than our ice sword, which is good, and it has one of those bonus damage to undead things that don't actually work, but we're not worried about that because, yeah, the sun sword, that's something good. It's going to be the best weapon that our knight can use right now, and whenever we find a better weapon for our knight, it's going to turn into the best weapon that our red wizard can use, with the exception of the Mazmium. We also don't want to ignore Thor's hammer, which is a white wizard weapon, but it's another item that we can use in battle, and this one will give us a free casting of Lit 2, making it another Zeus Gauntlet, although this one only occupies a weapon slot which is even better. Of course, would love to have more Zeus gauntlets, so having two of these things is great. We can sell off that Vorpal when we get back to Canaria, and we may want to shuffle some of the weapons around so that we can diversify our items that can be used in battle. Over here we can sell off some superfluous armors, and a lot of these things are going to be worth a ton of money, so we're going to be rolling in the cash after this trip. Once we're done here, we want to make sure to pick up 99 heal potions. And yeah, yeah, we know the policy, man. One heal potion at a time, we get it. We're doing it. Whatever, get 99 heal potions. And then we're going to make our way to a place called the Waterfall Cave. The Waterfall Cave is where we're going to find the cube that we're going to need to get into the floating castle. Without that cube, we will just be able to stay in the Mirage Tower, and we've already looted that place. So we're going to make our way over here, near the city of Onrak. You may have noticed the waterfall as we flew over this area before, and it's certainly called out on the map over on the graphics in the left-hand side of the screen. This time, when we fight some river monsters, we can try out our new combination of the Thor Hammer and the Zeus Gauntlet. And we might as well just use our most powerful attacks because we're going to be able to stop an onrack on the way to the waterfall cave and use the inn there. But here's that Thor hammer, and you can see it's just as effective as the Zeus gauntlet. Lit 3 was probably a bit overkill for that last gator, but whatever, we weren't taking any chances. And it seems that our knight is leveled up to level 21, and so did Vito. Excellent. Now we'll head back over here to the city of Onrak, and we can use the inn here. You can also use the item shop, but remember, this is one of those obnoxious item shops where the heal potions aren't on the top line. And before we leave Onrak, we definitely want to hit up the level 7 magic shop here, and purchase the blind spell, because it's the only chance we're going to get. We're not going to want to come all the way back here to get that magic spell. And we might as well purchase a rub for Vito if we have extra money, because there's only two level 7 magic spells that a red wizard can learn, and a rub is one of them. It's not a particularly good spell, it protects your people from rub magic, which, I mean, they're all protected from anyway with our pro rings and such. 
but it is nice to be able to fill out his entire magic spell roster. We'll use the inn, and that'll save our game and heal up our magic and health. And then we're going to jump back into our canoe, but before that it looks like we hit an encounter here in the forest, so a couple of those wyverns. Quickly take those guys out. And now back to what we were doing. We'll get into our canoe and we'll take it up the river where we'll find that waterfall cave. And here's another encounter with some easy monsters. No problem taking out these guys, especially considering that we have the Zeus Gauntlet and the Thor Hammer. Although we may want to be a little bit more conservative with our magic now because we are about to go inside of a dungeon. Although this is a very short dungeon, and with all the equipment we just got from that Mirage Tower, we are going to be quite well equipped for it this time. You can use tents and cabins and all that sort of thing while you're in your canoe, so that's good to know. And a tent is a good way to heal all of her people without wasting any heal potions. They only cost 15 more gold, and they heal the entire party, so there's no reason why you shouldn't use multiple tents. We should be able to handle most of the encounters that we find here in the Waterfall Cave, and this small set of undead should be no problem. Once again, we can use all of our items to defeat these guys. The Mage Staff, the Light Axes, the Zeus's Gauntlet, whatever you have, remember that since they're undead, using the Light Axes and the Mage Staff are your best items, and then whatever's left is good. You should be able to easily finish these guys off without giving them much of a chance to even attack you back. They're kind of slow. You'll get some decent experience and money for fighting those guys and then you just want to make your way up through these narrow corridors and then head over to the left. The plan is to kind of cut through the middle of the map and make our way all the way to the left side and then we'll travel down to the lower left corner. These guys, Mud Goals, which I think is short for Golem, are very resistant to magic, so it's almost a waste of time to use magic on these guys, but they can easily be defeated with our melee attacks, so just split up your melee attackers and those guys will go down very quickly. The most of those you'll ever have to fight in the single battle is going to be three here in the Waterfall Cave, and in that case, you may just want to focus on two of them and finish off the third one in a second round of combat. Nightmares are an enemy that we fought many times. Remember that they are weak against ice, but that shouldn't matter too much here since they're not a big threat when there's only one to three of them. And of course, here's that undead encounter again. We know what to do against those guys. There's only one treasure room here in the waterfall cave, so that's the only place that we need to go to. We don't have to worry about finding a bunch of chests that are scattered all over the place. And with such a large map down here on a single floor, that actually could have been a nightmare. It was nice of the programmers to do this for us. They added in some Paralisks with our undead this time, and although Paralisks won't be hit by the light axes, we should probably use them anyway, because Paralisks only have 44 hit points, so if we use two light axes, the Zeus Gauntlet, and the Mage Staff, we'll get those Paralisks. Should not be an issue. Since we're heavily invested into pro rings, our party wasn't worried about their rub attack anyway. So the Paralisks, not a very big threat. Of course, the biggest threat here are the wizard mummies, but they're just only a slightly bigger threat than the other enemies, which is not all that much. Remember, that space is a guarded space, so you don't want to step down there again. And up here we'll find that second ribbon, we'll find a wizard staff which casts the confused spell. It's not the worst, but it's not something that we'll probably use very often. And then we'll also get a whole bunch of money. But don't forget to talk to this robot. Talking to that guy is how we get the cube, and that is the key item that we must find here in the waterfall cave. Defense, you would think is some kind of shield or something, but no, defense is actually a weapon that our red mage can use, and it's a pretty good one for this point in the game. You can also use it to cast the spell of Ruse in battle for free. We know that Ruse magic can actually be pretty handy, and on a decent weapon that deals the same kind of damage that the Ice Sword did, well, that's just a win-win. We may never actually use it to cast the Ruse spell, but it's nice to have it anyway. 
we can use Exit to get out of there, and then we can head over to Canaria Town, where we can use the inn to save our game, and if you need to, you can definitely stop at the item store here and pick up some more heal potions, because the next thing that we're going to do is head back to that Mirage Tower, but this time we're taking it all the way to the top and entering the Floating Castle. And as you may recall from before, since we got all the treasure in floor one, we can just loop up and down and get to floor number two. Floor number two we'll need to walk on a bit more, but we can actually shortcut our way through this floor as well. And it's our old friend the vampire, and he brought another vampire buddy with him. This time he's not a boss, but he can still do the same dazzle stun move that he could do before and he's still weak against our Light Axe Mage Staff combination. We're going to need to go through a lot of levels this time, so we need to be a bit more conservative with our magic. We don't want to use any good spells when we're here in the Mirage Tower if we can help it. There's the stairway that we need to get to, so we just need to weave around these pillars and get up in there. Three Chimeras, well, that's quite a few. We may actually need to use a spell this time. Remember that these guys are weak against ice magic, and there's not going to be that many enemies that we're going to be facing up in the floating castle that are weak against ice magic, so it's probably okay to use a few of those spells right here. Whenever you fight just one chimera, or maybe even two, it's not that big of a problem. But with three of them, that could mean a lot of those cremate moves coming your way, so it's good to wipe them out as quickly as you can. And with them defeated, Beat and Game both get promoted to level 22. Whenever we get to the Floating Castle, that's the next to last dungeon in the game. And we're almost there. Once we finish that and light up the Orb of Wind, there will only be one more dungeon we need to clear. This one's a throwback to the guards in the Waterfall Cave. And you can see the path that we need to take. We just want to go right in here through these pillars. Cut up around. We can talk to this robot if we want to. He tells us that one of us escaped with a cube. So that's a hint that we need the cube to move on here. But up here on floor 3, this is a very short one. Once again, we drew the Catman enemies, which I suppose are more common up on this floor. But like, man, can we get a little bit of variety in the enemies, please? We do need to heal some of our people and use some pure potions to get that poison off. It seems like every other battle, Vito is poisoned. Like, man, what have you been getting into there, Vito? Are, are you on drugs? We're going to switch some things around. I moved the ribbon over to our black wizard. We're about to fight a mini-boss, a blue dragon. And without some protection against his lightning attack, our black wizard could quickly be killed, and I'd rather that just didn't happen here. So that's why I switched the ribbon over to him, and that should hopefully protect him from that thunder. Well, here it is. We'll see how it worked out. And the ribbon comes through. He only took 70 damage and easily survived. A few melee attacks quickly finish off the blue dragon, even with 454 hit points. But that thunder attack can deal quite a bit of damage, so we need to be careful and make sure that our black wizard is protected. We'd rather not have to use our life spell this early on into the dungeon. We'll let game keep the ribbon for now, because we are going to find the third ribbon up here in the floating castle. So here we are on floor number one. This first battle features an air elemental, and is the fourth and final elemental that we'll meet here in the game. Unlike all of the other kinds, the air elemental is the only one that you can run away from, which is pretty weird because, like, of all the elements, it seems like air would be the hardest one to escape. The Grey Naga, on the other hand, is a mostly pointless enemy that just casts a lot of spells that actually don't damage us. Occasionally it'll attack too, but you can mostly just ignore the Grey Naga and focus all of your energy on the air elementals, and once those are gone, you can clean up whatever Grey Nagas are left behind. Up here we find a pretty useful item, the Bane Sword. It doesn't deal a lot of damage when you attack with it, but it allows you to cast the spell of Bane for free. 
The spell of Bane will do a poison-based knockout attack on all the enemies on the screen, and if you know which ones are vulnerable to it, that is pretty good. Up here, it looks like we're facing that Grey Naga air combination again. Remember, you want to focus your attacks on the air, and don't worry so much about the Grey Naga. Airs are very strong against magic spells, so you're mostly wasting magic using them against airs unless you use your most powerful ones. Instead, melee attacks should take care of them, and then you can just have everybody all out attack on the Grey Naga, and she'll go down with ease. Yeah, it's not going to take too many hits like that to finish her off. With those enemies defeated, both Yu Can and Vito are both promoted to level 2. Upon his promotion, Yu Can said, Anything is possible with teamwork. Yeah, thanks, man. Once those guys are out of the way, we're going to head over to the left, and we finally encountered the most common enemy set here, the Bad Man. You may remember these guys from the Mirage Tower. They're fairly strong against magic, so you have two options on how you can fight them here. You can try to use all of your items and slowly whittle them down, or you can have your melee attackers attack them individually. Either way could work. We're going to use the items this time and see how that turns out. The item plan is probably better if you're fighting five badmans. With only three, it may actually be better to just do some attacks, but there's a good chance that you'll take out at least one or two of these guys in the first round of combat, and if you're lucky, you'll get them all using the item plan. If you don't, you can just use melee attacks to clean up whoever's left. Now to get back to looting the floating castle. There's four chests over here on the left side. It looks like they mostly have money in them, but if you needed an extra heal potion, well, I guess there's that too. Once you've grabbed all of those, we need to head back over to the right side where there's a few more chests we haven't grabbed yet, and the stairway to get out of here is at the top. It looks like we ran into the bad man enemies again. If you're going to use magic against them instead of your items, make sure that you're going to use a big one. You can go up around this room or down below it, it seems to be equally good either way. Head over this direction, and we're going to open up this door where we'll find five treasure boxes. This one only had 180 gold, so nothing great there, and there's another heel helmet and a pro ring. We have a lot of pro rings already, but they are worth a ton of cash, so a pro ring is a good one to keep around and sell. And it's our good old friend the Eye from the Ice Cave. He wasn't that hard to defeat back then, and now that we have ways to protect ourselves from rub attacks, well, he's super easy this time. You should have no problem if you run into the Eye enemies, just have everybody do an all-out attack. Once you have all the chests on the right side, we're gonna head up to the top, where we'll be able to go to floor two, and, well, another Eye. The eyes do not have it this time. They can cast a lot of spells, but I don't think I've ever seen them get beyond the first one. Looks like we did need to take care of some healing potions from all the battles we've been fighting here on floor one, so now is a good time to do that. And it's this triangular thing that teleports you to the next floor, so that's what we're looking for, not stairways. We need teleporters. A single gray naga is a joke, so don't worry about her. And up here we can find a house, that's something good. And this is going to be another piece of armor, so if we want to get it, we're going to have to drop something. And the thing that we're going to drop is that extra heel helmet that we certainly don't need. We certainly didn't need this silver helmet either, so we're going to be jettisoning that thing as soon as we need to pick up another piece of armor. These chimeras always make me think of that poor kid in Full Metal Alchemist. I'm sorry for bringing that up for anybody that's seen it. And here's another piece of armor, so yeah, it's time to get rid of that stupid silver helmet. Get out of here, silver helmet. Alright, an opal gauntlet. Well, I mean, I guess that's better, but it sure isn't a pro ring, so we're going to be throwing that away too. Over here, we're going to face four manticores. 
Manticores are an enemy that we used to fight back in the Cardia Islands, but now we're facing four of them. And this is a good opportunity to try out that Bane Sword. It may work on several of these guys. Hopefully all of them. Well, no, three out of four ain't bad. Now we just have to finish off that last one and that should be pretty easy. So if you see a big set of Manticores, that could be a good time to try out that Bane Sword if you have it already. With those guys out of the way, we're going to head over here on the right to grab some treasures. They're a little bit more distributed here on the second floor. Well, we're going to go up here and throw away that opal gauntlet. Don't need that. And let's see what's in here. An opal shield. An opal shield's actually kind of good, but we only need one of those, and with the Aegea shield, we don't actually need any, so we'll be throwing it away. So let's see what we have here. Ah, uh, this. This is what we were looking for. The third and final ribbon. It's unfortunate that there isn't a ribbon for every member of our party, but we certainly want to get the three that do exist. The ribbon is an iconic Final Fantasy item that you'll see in pretty much every Final Fantasy game that I can think of. Whenever you find it in those games, it's usually one of the best pieces of armor that you can find, so pay attention if you see a ribbon in another Final Fantasy. Over here, we can face an evil man enemy, which is not the same as a bad man. These guys can cast a ton of different spells on us, so we just want to get rid of the evil man right away. The second spell on their list is Nuke. You definitely do not want an evil man to live long enough to cast Nuke. Get those guys out of there immediately. Down here we're going to find two very unique pieces of armor that are class specific to the white and black wizards. The first one that we'll pick up is the white shirt, which can only be worn by a white wizard, and when used in battle, has the effect of casting the Invisible 2 spell for free, which is super awesome. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of slots for armor, especially ones that we can't wear, and it's not worth a lot of money, so we're just going to drop it. You may want to keep the white shirt and use it as an item, and maybe even work it into your plan in the game, but you'll need to figure out which other pieces of armor you can get rid of to take its place. Maybe you don't need the Zeus gauntlet at this point, although it is very good. Maybe you can throw away that extra pro ring that we were planning on selling for 10,000 gold. By the end of the game, almost every single slot is going to be spoken for, so you're certainly going to have to decide what to keep and what to throw out. Over here we'll find even more gold. Not super exciting at this point, but we do need money to buy that level 8 magic spell, the nuke, and we'll probably need it for a few other things. When these manticores try to use their stinger attack, it's just not going to do anything anymore. It's pretty hard to poison us now that we all have ribbons and our knight has the Aegea shield. Down here we'll find a key item, the adamant. We've been looking for this adamant stuff for a very long time, since way back in part one of the video. But now that we have it, the blacksmith in the dwarf cave can make us one of the greatest weapons in the game, Excalibur. Once you have the adamant and have collected all the other chests, you can hit up the teleporter at the bottom of the screen. Here's some more of those manticores. They're not very intimidating at this point in the game. So we'll just take them out using our items and we can essentially just ignore what they're trying to do to us. Nice stinger attacks. Ineffective. 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 Try something else, manticores. That stuff ain't working. And for your troubles, you're gonna get Bane Sorted. Well, we did a little ineffectiving ourselves that time. The Bane Sword doesn't always work, and while it works pretty well against these Manticores, you're always rolling the dice when you use those instant KO effects. It still doesn't matter because the Manticores are probably not going to hurt us very much, so with an all-out attack we'll quickly be able to finish off this last one and move on with our lives. But not before a few more of our characters get promoted to the next level. Good work there, beaten game! 
the third floor of the floating castle is sprawling and it feels like it's almost falling apart. And it has kind of a cool look to it. Through this window we can see the entire world. The four forces are flowing together into the center of the four altars. Into the Temple of Fiends. So that's where the final dungeon is going to be. In the Temple of Fiends. Not to be confused with the Temple of Friends, although a high-level Chandler Bing would be terrifying. We'll just fast motion through these manticores. We've definitely fought these guys before. And back to the action. Over here we find six treasure chests. Some of them are unexciting, like that soft potion. But there are some that are slightly more interesting. Over here, we're going to have to drop another piece of armor. This time we're going to drop the buckler, because the item that we're going to find soon is going to replace it. First we found that cloth armor, which was a trap. We're definitely going to be dumping that thing. It's worth like two gold to sell it. And it's certainly not worth wearing. Get out of here, cloth armor. And here is the pro cape. The pro cape is sort of like a shield that almost any character can use. It replaces the buckler for our red wizard, and will provide a little bit of extra absorb for him. Whenever we find universal items like this, I like to prioritize giving them to the red wizard first, because remember, he's the one that can cast the life spell, so if anybody else dies, it's not as big of a deal, but if the red wizard dies, it's a disaster. Four red hydras. This looks pretty serious, but it's time to use the other piece of armor, the one that we actually kept, the black shirt. The black shirt, when used as an item, will use the spell of Ice 2. Ice 2 is an extremely powerful spell. It's more powerful than Lit 2 or Fire 2 or even Harm 2. Three spells that we've been using very frequently from items and have been very happy about. Let's see how it goes. Yeah! The black shirt just wrecks these red hydras which are weak to ice magic, but because ice naturally deals more damage than fire or lit, it's going to be great against general enemies as well. It also provides a solid amount of defense when worn by the black wizard, and while not quite as much as the opal bracelet, there's only one opal bracelet in the game and you can't all wear it, so this is a really good choice for our black wizard. We can throw away a pro ring here because we're about to pick up another pro ring. If you have extra inventory slots, well then you may be able to hold a few of these extra pro rings and bring them back to the store to sell them. They are worth a pretty penny. But we don't have a lot of extra inventory space, even with a character like the Master that doesn't require a full set of armor. Here we're facing those manticores again, but instead of using the Bane Sword this time, we're just going to start using the Black Shirt. The Black Shirt is going to be a big part of our strategy moving forward. I mean, being able to cast Ice 2 all the time for free, that is pretty good. And here it is. It's definitely going to get some good damage on these manticores, and it took out two of them there. And the mage staff finishes them off. So we are extremely effective just using our items right now, and Vito made it to level 23. Wow, we are really getting up there now. With those items collected, we'll head over here to the left side where we'll find even more treasure chests, and we can also see the teleporter that'll take us to floor 4. Over here, we'll find a katana, which is a great weapon if you happen to have a ninja on your team. We don't, so we won't need the katana. A ninja is the only class that can use it. This would have been a nightmare battle earlier in the game, but now that three of our characters have the ribbon and our knight has the dragon armor, we have quite a bit of resistance to fire, so you'll see that it's just not very good against us anymore. So do all the fire twos that you want, man cats. It's not really going to work. One thing that is annoying about man-cat enemies though is that they are fairly resistant to magic. So we're going to use our item strategy here again and that's quickly going to take out the medusas. 
but it might take a little bit more to finish off all the man cats, even though they don't have a whole lot of hit points. We probably won't get them in the first wave. And man, that is a lot of fire magic coming down on us. I'm glad we all have ribbons. Despite their resistance, we don't need to do a lot of damage to these guys to be able to finish them off. So even though we're only hitting them for like 20 damage each time, it's going to be enough to chip away at that 110 hit point. Once we get to the second round here, we're just going to use all of our items again. And as soon as we get to maybe one or two of the items, it should certainly finish off every man cat sitting here. So Thor, Zeus, Mage, and the Black Shirt. With your powers combined, these guys are doomed. Yeah, nice try with that slow magic. Didn't you know that we're resistant to that stuff? A few of them are resorting to attacks. Hopefully they won't attack Vito, who's getting pretty weak down there. We're going to need to use a lot of healing potions to fix this. Oh, Alright, I'm glad he just did slow and didn't do something that deals damage. And that should do it. Alright, we finished off that large screen of enemies. And you can is promoted to level 23. You may want to run from those guys if you see them, but our team is robust enough to defeat even that many man cats. That's just a pretty mean encounter. Alright, once everybody's healed up, we're going to hit that teleporter and head up to floor 4, which is kind of a confusing one. You want to go up to the first intersection, then go left, then go up, and then go left again. You just need to alternate each time. Up, left, up, left. Also, down, right, down, right would also work. Either pattern is good. Just don't forget what you were doing last whenever you go to a battle. That's the one thing that can mess you up. So we're heading left right now, and as soon as we get to the intersection, we're going to head up. This area just repeats forever, so if you mess it up, it could be hard to find the transporter. This is the fifth floor, and this is where the boss is. But even more importantly, this is where Warmech lives. Warmech is the most deadly standard enemy in the entire game. He only lives on this little bridge here. Most of the time, you're going to hit something like this. These Naochos, which are not that big of a deal. They just poison you, and they're pretty easy to kill. But you need to make sure that you heal yourself between every battle, just in case you meet Warmech. We just need to get to the end. The boss is actually a lot easier to beat than Warmech, and if we make it across there, we'll be fine. But there's a 5% chance with every encounter we meet that it could be him, so we need to be prepared just in case. If you think I'm overreacting about Warmech, you're wrong. Warmech has a thousand hit points, and the first attack that he often does is the nuke spell, which will wreck our party. The big problem with Warmech, though, is there's a very high chance that you'll be surprised by him, and he can knock off one, maybe even two of your party members before you even have a chance to react. The final boss wouldn't even do that to you. If Warmech had as many hit points as the final boss, I think Warmech may be more difficult. That may be a bit of an exaggeration, but the point still stands. Make sure that you're healed up between battles just in case you run into Warmech, and if you make it to the other side, consider yourself lucky, and don't do what I'm about to do and start walking up and down this path hoping to meet up with Warmech. Instead, you should just fight Tiamat, save the last orb, leave this area and save the game, then come back here later if you want to fight Warmech. That way you won't have to get all the treasure chests again as you go through the floating castle. And, oh, there he is. And he surprised us, see? Luckily he didn't surprise us with his nuke attack. Treat this guy like a boss. Use fast on your melee attackers. And it looks like we probably should even use Cure 3 on the knight to try to keep him alive and maybe even have him survive another hit. 
Especially if Warmack uses nuclear, we may actually lose two characters right now, which would be pretty bad. Only the Knight and the Master probably can deal enough damage to this guy for it to even make a difference, so make sure to get your fast spells on them before your casters get murdered. We need to keep the Red Mage alive though so that we can cast Life Magic after this if anyone dies. So if he gets low on health, you may want to use a Curing spell on him. It's not like he's going to be very effective attacking this guy. Hopefully we'll get some critical hits. Critical hits are the best way to get through Warmech's thick armor. Good thing is, our Master and our Knight are pretty decent at making critical hits at this point in the game. So we just want to use our most powerful magic with the Black Wizard while he's still alive. Use Ice 3, use Lit 3, they don't do a lot of damage. It's just going to be cutting a few points into this guy, but every little bit helps. And hopefully we'll be able to get a few critical hits and finish him off. Well, we don't have a lot of curing magic to try to protect our knight. So we're going to use cure 2 and, I don't know, we'll try fire 3. Well, it doesn't matter. Game has been killed. A single attack from Warmack took him out. And wow, that was a 10 hit critical from Beat and he still isn't dead. Oh, this shouldn't take too much more though. That did it. We did it, okay. We defeated Warmech, and we will get just a ton of experience points in gold for beating him, so of course Beat leveled up. We'll need to use our life magic, and we're going to have to use a lot of potions to fix this. But the good news is, Tiamat can be defeated very, very easily. In fact, after fighting Warmech, this boss is going to be a big joke. Tiamat's a real boss, don't get me wrong. We're still going to take her seriously and heal everybody up in case things go awry. But Tiamat has a terribly debilitating weakness. Let's touch the ball. Lightning erupts from the Fiend's ball. So you've come this far. I, Tiamat, the Fiend of Wind, will now put an end to your adventure. No. No, you won't. We'll have our Red Mage use fast on the knight in case this plan doesn't work but we're going to use the Black Wizard to cast Brack on Tiamat. Tiamat is surprisingly weak against poison magic, and Brack has extremely accurate single hit KO poison magic that has a very good chance of taking her out in a single shot. And we did it. Tiamat was broken into pieces. The Bane spell can also work, and also the Bane sword, although they don't have as high of a probability of being successful. We won't be able to do this when we fight Tiamat again in the Temple of Fiends, but this first time, well, she's pretty easy. We want to make sure to use a tent or a cabin to save our game out here, because there are some dangerous encounters out here in the desert. And as we walk back, oh, we hit the T-Rex. Well. The T-Rex is the most powerful enemy that you can possibly face on the world map, so you want to treat this guy like a boss. Use fast on your melee attackers. Magic does not deal a lot of damage to this guy, but he doesn't have a lot of absorb, so you can certainly put a good hit on him with some melee attacks. And wow, Beat hit him for over 900 damage. Nice work, Beat. You can levels up to level 24. But that is the most dangerous overworld enemy, so if you do see a T-Rex, take him seriously, because he can hit you for a good bit of damage. Here in Canaria Town, it's time to get prepped up for the final mission. We can sell off any items that we probably aren't going to use to make some inventory space, and of course we need to purchase 99 potions, all individually. One potion, please. Thank you, sir. Would you like anything else? One potion, please. Thank you. What else? Ugh, very frustrating, but make sure that you get 99 of those, because you're definitely going to need them in the final area. We can use the inn here one more time, and before we head over to the Temple of Fiends, we do have one more very important errand that we need to run and that's to make our way back to the Dwarf Cave so that we can give that adamant to the blacksmith. If you ever wondered where Excalibur came from before the Lady of the Lake gave it to King Arthur, 
uh, came right from here, from the blacksmith in the dwarf cave. It deals a massive 45 damage and adds 35 to hit percent. So yeah, Excalibur is super awesome. We'll equip our knight with it right away, and as a secondary benefit, we also get to equip our red wizard with the sun sword. Nice. Once we have Excalibur, we can make our way back to the stairs, where we can board our airship and fly over to the Temple of Fiends. We remember where it is. It's right there, northwest of Conaria, where it's always been. We've done it. We've made it to Chapter 7, Quest's End. And here we are, back at the Temple of Fiends, back where it all started. Everything has finally come full circle. You may recall that I mentioned there were a few treasure chests hidden behind locked doors here that we didn't get the first time around, and I said we'd come back for them later. There's a good reason why we didn't pick them up. Weapons like this rune sword are only effective against certain enemy types, and here in the NES version of the game, that effect is bugged so there's no bonus damage even when you're fighting the appropriate type of monsters. On top of that, these weapons don't deal very good base damage, and by the time you would be able to get the locked doors open using the Mystic Key, you'd certainly have silver swords for your party members, and the weapons you find here, they're just not going to be as good. A lot of the bugs in the game are blamed on programmer Nasir Gabelli, who was the last member of the Square A team that I didn't mention in the first part of the video. Nasir was born in Iran and didn't actually speak Japanese, but was an extremely gifted programmer. They actually hired him on to Square because he was really good at programming 3D stuff, and they wanted him to make things like 3D World Runner and Rad Racer. He's also credited with designing that slide puzzle minigame. For somebody that doesn't speak Japanese, I think he did a pretty good job. Now that we're in here, we can actually speak to the bats this time. Do you remember back in the town of Lefine where the people said that their sky warriors were turned into bats? Well, here they are. They've been here this entire time, but they've been unable to speak to us because the four orbs were darkened. Now that the orbs have been lit up, we must travel back in time 2,000 years. 2,000 years ago is when the problem started. That's where the real enemy is. That's what we must do. To go back in time, well, conveniently, there's a time machine right here. Oh, oh that's good. So let's do it. Let's go back in time. The Temple of Fiends Past is a massive maze with tons of dead ends and eight fun-filled floors. But did you expect anything less for the final dungeon of this game? Here we encountered four frost dragons. Whew, that is quite a few frost dragons. They're weak against fire magic, so we should be able to take them out using a combination of fire two and the mage staff. But that blizzard attack, man, whew. That can really mess our party up if all four of these dragons decide to use Blizzard. Hopefully, at least a few of them will be taken out before they all get to attack. We'll use Thor's Hammer from our Knight. And this combination of items should probably finish off all of the dragons. They only have 200 hit points. The first thing we need to do is take the stairs in the lower right corner of floor 1. Floor 2 is very straightforward, we're just going to cut straight across. And when we get to floor 3, we need to make our way to the room in the middle. Now here's a tricky fight. Once again we have two options when we're fighting against a large team of bad man enemies. We can try to use all of our items. We certainly want to conserve our magic spells whenever we can here. There's a lot of floors we need to get through. So we're going to use the black shirt. That's a no-brainer for the black wizard. 
But the question is, should we use our melee attackers to just attack and hopefully take out one or two of the bad man enemies in the first round? Or should we have everybody commit to using their magic items and hopefully maybe a few of the bad men will be killed in the first round, but there's a good chance that none of them will die and we'll need to finish them off in the second round. When there's just this many enemies, it seems like the item route is the way to go. And it looks like it did manage to take out two, no, three of the bad mans, which is probably more than using our melee attackers would have done. So that was probably the right thing to do. When we use our items again in this round, we should be able to quickly finish off the remaining enemies. It will probably take two or maybe three of our items to do it, depending on what order they come up in. And that was a tough one, we definitely took a lot of damage there, but Game was promoted to level 24. We're hoping to get him up to level 25. As soon as he gets to level 25, he'll be able to use nuke magic, well, he'll be able to use it after staying at an inn or using a house. But in any case, nuke is certainly a spell that would like to have available to us whenever we're fighting the final boss. So take out these bad man enemies, they're a lot easier when there's fewer of them, and when there's fewer of them, you may want to just have some of your melee attackers attack in the first round instead of using their magic items. Make sure everybody's healed up. There are some dangerous battles you might encounter here. And when we go through this door, we're going to fight a mini-boss, the Phantom. This is the only place in the game where the Phantom appears, and much like the eye before him, he has a lot of spells that he can cast. He's also an undead enemy with only 360 hit points, so our team is going to make short work of this guy. The first spell that he casts is Stop, and stop is not very effective on our party members that have a ribbon. You'll notice that it did get our knight and took him out of the action, but that's okay. It doesn't take too much to finish off the phantom, and although the rewards are weak, there are two chests in this room that are going to give us 110,000 gold pieces. Yeah, we are rich now. That's like Bill Gates money. Whenever we finish this thing, I think I might buy an island. Maybe a nice one over there in the Cardias. Nah, forget that. Let's just blow all that gold on NFTs. Once we get through Floor 3, we'll find ourselves back on Floor 2, so we want to make our way around to the left. This time, we encounter a combination of Frost Giants and Frost Wolves, and you'll recall that Frost Wolves are actually kind of dangerous because they can use that Frost attack that hits our whole party. We can try the Bane Sword here, it might not be very effective on the Giants, but maybe it'll take care of some of the Wolves, although our other items might just take them out anyway. Let's see what happens here. Oh, here's the Mage Staff, which should be very good against this set of enemies, considering that it actually does fire too and the Frost Giants are laying into our characters, but not really dealing a lot of damage. And as we thought, the Bane Sword does not do a whole heck of a lot to a Frost Giant. Luckily, none of these guys should have very many hit points remaining. So even our Black Wizard attacking with that Cat Claw might be able to deal significant damage. We'll just split up the attacks here and whew, 466, that would have taken him out in a single hit and wow, 560 from the Master. Had to kind of one-up the Knight there after that 466 critical, like nah nah, nice critical bro, hold my beer. To get out of here we need to get to the stairway in the upper left corner and oh it's the Frost Wolves and the Frost Giants again, well we know what to do here. Hit them with fire or lightning attacks, and they'll go down very fast. Make sure to use your heal potions between battles. Heal potions, not super great to use in a battle when it takes your entire turn. Definitely don't want to be doing that. Head up to the stairs in the upper left corner, and that takes us back here to floor one. This part is very straightforward. We just gotta go all the way across to the left, where we'll find another stairway, and that will take us into the first basement. 
these worms aren't very tough. They do have a lot of hit points, but our similar strategies are going to take them out just the same. A nice big critical from the knight, and a nice critical from the master. Quickly remove those worms from the action. Once you're doing a lot of hits every round of combat, you're going to probably get a lot of criticals, especially when you get to these higher levels, which also raises your critical hit percentage. And here it is. Basement 1, the Earth Floor. Down here we're going to fight Earth-themed enemies. It's pretty much just all the same enemies that we've seen before, but now we're going to be seeing them in larger quantities. Remember that the Mud Goal and the Rock Goal enemies are pretty good against magic, so melee attacks are going to win the day here. Even have the Red Wizard do a melee attack. These guys kind of fold under melee attacks, which for something that looks like a big rocky golem doesn't make a whole lot of sense. To get through this floor, you need to go all the way to the top. Once you get up there, you have to go all the way over to the right, and then all the way down to the bottom. And here we'll face three Earth Elementals. You can't run away from Earth Elementals, so we gotta fight these guys. And they're vulnerable to fire magic, so things like the Mage Staff are going to be pretty good here. Although we can have our Black Mage use Fire 2. We don't need to save all of those Fire 2 Litz 2 spells. It's about time to start using them. Alright, one Earth is remaining. Everybody can all out attack this guy and he should go down pretty easily. As usual, we get a critical hit from our master, and then we'll just keep following the path down. Here we meet four Sorias, and Soria is the rarest enemy encounter here on this floor, but it's a pretty lucky one. They just seem to want to use their glance power, which is ineffective on all of our people. So yeah, do your glance thing, Sorias it's not very good. Whenever they attack, they also deal minimal damage, so we don't really have to worry about these guys. Do not use any good magic when you're fighting against a team of Sorias. It's just a waste. Simply use your items, use melee attacks, whatever you want to do, but these guys really can't hurt you. They're fairly innocent, and it's a shame that we have to murder them right now. Well, with that, those guys are gone, and we can proceed on to the bottom of the earth floor. And at the bottom, we're going to have to fight a boss. This is the Temple of Fiends after all, so we're going to be fighting all four fiends again. The first one is Lich. Since this takes place in the past and the fiends are younger, they're actually more powerful this time. Lich has 500 hit points, and he can cast the spell of Nuke, which will totally wreck our party. Luckily, he doesn't have a lot of hit points here, so we should be able to finish him off in a single round of attacks. We don't even have to use things like Fast to beat this guy. A little bit of Fire 3, and a couple of melees from the Knight and the Master, and Lich will go right down. He's not very fast either, so there's a good chance that you'll be able to get all your attacks in before he ever casts that nuke spell. But you do need to be ready just in case you do get nuked. Up here we face three Agamas. Back when we were in the Gurgu Volcano, we would just fight one of these guys and he would be a space guardian. But up here we can fight two, three, or even four Agamas. They're not that big of a deal though. We're so much more powerful now that three Agamas is no sweat. A little bit of ice magic, our items like the Thor's hammer, the Zeus gauntlet, the black shirt. They'll finish off these Agamas with no problem. And that heat attack that was such a big issue before is severely blunted by all the equipment we have now like the dragon armor and the ribbons. So we shouldn't have a lot of trouble with these guys. You may have noticed though that these are fire enemies, and as we watch Beat get promoted to level 25, it starts to sink in that this is the fire floor. Up here is a pair of gray worms, and since we have the black shirt which casts ice too, that's probably going to be enough to really take these guys down. A few melee attacks plus that black shirt should definitely be enough to finish off two of these guys. The only time we ever have to worry at all about Grey Worms is if you fight four of them, and even that isn't too tough. 
feet should be able to finish this guy off. Yep. No sweat. The gray worms go down. And we proceed deeper into the fire floor. So we want to head over to the right here. And then we're going to head down past those statues. And over here is the stairway that will take us to the next floor. And that's also where the boss hangs out. Which is the rematch with Carrie. But if we stay down here at the bottom, there is some treasure that we can find on this floor. There's some more Grey Worms for us to battle. And of the treasures that we can find on this floor, there's really only one chest that's of particular importance to us, and it's this one. The one that contains the second Pro Cape. You may remember that the Pro Cape is a shield that almost anyone can use, so we're going to want to equip our casters with both of them. Once we have the pro cape, if you want to, you can head over here to the right where we'll find a treasure chest full of money. But first, we're going to face off with four fire elementals. They're elementals so you can't run away. And with powers like that black shirt, these guys are going to be pretty easy. We wouldn't want to run away anyway. There's the black shirt, which should do severe damage to these guys. Uh, killed that one. And a few melee attacks from our knight. And our master will take out two more. And just an all-out attack on the last fire will finish that last one off, although it makes a lot of sense for the black wizard to use that black shirt again. And that's it. Four fires defeated just that easily. And you can is promoted to level 25, and so is Vito. Over here we'll find that chest. Feel free to ignore this one if you want, but it is a lot of money, 26,000 gold. With all that cash weighing down our pockets, we're going to make our way back the same way that we came. And there's actually another area where we can find treasures, but first, it's time to face off with three red dragons. Just like when we fought the frost dragons, you could fight up to four of them up here. So take them seriously, use the black shirt just like you're going to use against pretty much everything on the fire floor, and finish off the remaining enemies with your melee attacks and of course another black shirt attack from the black wizard. The black wizard likes that black shirt. It looks good on him though. The red dragons are defeated, and once again we can move on. The items on the left side of the room here are not as exciting, so feel free to skip them over if you want to. Unless, for some reason, you are running a party that has two ninjas in it, in which case you'll definitely want to go and pick up a second katana. But there's very low chance that you have that many ninjas in your party. I'd be surprised if you had more than one, that's for sure. So we can stop here, this is another pro ring, an item that's worth a lot of money if you want to sell it, but at this point, well, we don't really need it, so we'll just drop another pro ring so you can see that's what it is. And we'll re-equip the one that we had. So back to the status quo. And then there's a long walk down here to get to that katana. And it looks like we have three more of those agamas, so we're just going to run the same plan that we've been running the entire time. Black shirt, some melee attacks, these guys will go down quite quickly. Once we defeat them, we'll be able to make our way over to where that katana is. And it does make me wonder sometimes if at some point in the design process of the game, the developers considered letting the thief and the ninja in turn equip two weapons so that they can do more attacks. That would explain a lot about why the thief gets such bad weapons. If they were able to equip two of them and attack twice as many times with weapons, sort of like the black belt does with his fists, well, I mean, that might have been pretty good. But they may have decided that it was overpowered early on in the process, but never really rebalanced the thief. Now, that's all just wild speculation. I don't know if any of that is true. We do know that thieves don't really work as they were intended to work, but it does make me wonder if they were nerfed somewhere even earlier in the process. So, some red giants and more agamas. And up here, that's where that second katana is. So, if you did have two ninjas, 
a party that made it to the class change and actually got two ninjas would probably be pretty decent after those guys converted, but it would be pretty tough making it up there. You'd have to level up a lot in the early game. Well, we got the maximum gray worms this time. We'll still use the black shirt and have each one of our melee attackers pick out a different worm to fight, which should take three of them off the board pretty quickly. And then we'll just do an all-out attack and a black shirt on the last one. And that will finish him off. See you later, Grey Worms. So, even with four on the screen, still not a very big deal. I wonder how many of those we can actually defeat without a big problem. Twelve? Twenty? I don't know. Grey Worms, not a big threat. Of course, if four were no threat, two certainly isn't a problem. But Grey Worms are one of the most common encounters here on the fire floor, so we'll probably see a lot of those guys. And here's some more of them. Alright, Grey Worms, get them. And they're gone. Make your way back over here to the middle, where we'll find the stairs that will take us to basement floor number three. But before that, we're going to have to face off with Carrie again. And this time, she doesn't have the vulnerability to the hold spell, so we're not going to be able to do that trick this time. Carrie is noticeably more difficult this time. She's still resistant to magic, although doesn't have that vulnerability to the statuses anymore. But she has a good bit of absorbs, so our melee attackers don't do a ton of damage either. They still do good hits, and she only has 700 hit points, so if we're being very conservative with our magic, we may be able to get away with not using the fast spell on our melee attackers. But you might want to use the fast spell on your melee attackers. It'll probably save you a round or two of combat. In any case, we should just keep attacking against carry, have the black wizard use fast magic, or just use the black shirt to deal a little bit of damage. If you want to use some magic spells, well, they better be powerful ones because they're not going to do a lot of damage otherwise. Once she's out of the way, we'll be down to floor B3, the water floor. The water floor once again has some pretty common encounters. The most common are, of course, water elementals and then some combination of sea troll, sea snake, or lobsters. You can't run from water, but with a vulnerability to ice, having the black shirt around should soften these guys up, and your melee attackers should be able to do the rest. If you do have to fight a ton of waters, you may want to get some of those items involved, but when there's only three, the black shirt and some melee attacks should make short work of them. So one more round should finish these guys off, and that'll do it. Unlike the fire floor that we were just on, the water floor has no treasure chests for us to find, so this floor is a lot more straightforward. What we need to do to get through here is head through the door on the left side that's right below us now. There it is. And we'll cut through this room. Well, it seems that a few more waters have tried to rain on our parade. When there's this many of them, you may want to use Ice 3. Ice 3 will crush those guys. And once they're done, you need to exit the bottom of that room and then come up into this central room. Make your way to the middle. We'll want to heal up just in case any of our characters are damaged. You never know what we might meet over here. In front of those stone monuments, that's where you're going to want to start heading downwards. But first, well, five more waters. Huh. Well, the maximum amount of waters that you may have to face here is six, so at least we didn't have to fight that. But, I mean, can we get some different enemies here, game? There's five different possible encounters, and that one with the sea trolls and the sea snakes is equally likely as this one. But in any case, if the game keeps giving you waters, well, you know, freeze them into ice cubes and shatter them into bits. That's what we gotta do. Our melee attackers took out a few of them, and a few more melee attacks, and of course, yeah, we'll just even have the black mage attack this time, who cares, we're gonna easily knock off these last two. There we go. Yep, see, that guy was pretty much dead. And that's that. Was a little bit reckless, but it looks like Beat is leveled up to level 26, 
so he's going to be doing even more damage with his unarmed attack now. And down here, five more waters, seriously? All right. Over here in this hallway, this is where we're going to meet Kraken for the second time, so make sure everybody's healed up. If you remember the first time we fought Kraken, he was pretty nasty, and well, he's not gonna be any easier this time. We definitely want to use our fast magic on our melee attackers this time. This guy has 900 hit points, so that's quite a bit. And he'll use Lit 2 this time instead of just Ink, so he has a few new tricks in his bag. We don't really need to use Ruse this time, we just need to do some raw attacks. And we should be able to take out Kraken, especially if we're doing attacks like that, 458. Yeah, that'll finish this guy off quick. He doesn't have the same kind of vulnerability to Lit that he did before, but you can still use it to deal some decent damage to him. It's just not going to hit him like he did the last time. Those big, fast-dated melee attacks? That's the way to go. Those will finish off Kraken, and... Well, before we go down the stairs, they wanted us to fight the waters again. Well, I guess we hadn't fought enough of them. Hmm. Now well, they do say that you should drink a lot of water each day. So I guess that's what we're doing right now. We know how to fight these guys though. Use the black shirt, use ice magic, use whatever you got. But whenever these guys are defeated, we're going to be able to go down those stairs and finally reach the floor of wind, which is the last elemental floor. And on that floor of wind, that's where we're going to find the best weapon in the entire game. So it's gonna be worth it. We'll just finish off these last few guys. That should do it, I think. Oh yeah, oh yeah, that would have done it easily. And with that, you can reaches level 26 and so does Vito. Level 26 is probably higher than we need to finish the game, so we're doing really well right now. The levels go all the way up to 50, but we certainly don't need to get that high to finish the game. And once we get in here, we want to start working our way down to the bottom, because that's the way that we need to go to get that great weapon. Much like the water elementals that we had to face on the previous floor, up here on the floor of air, we're going to be fighting some air elementals. I find the best way to fight this many of them is to have the black wizard use the black shirt, which they're not vulnerable to, but at least it will deal damage to all of them. And then have your melee attackers each attack a different air, and hopefully at least one of them will get a critical hit and maybe take out theirs. Then in the second round you can start using your items, and any that were left alive after the first round will hopefully die. This nice little one-two punch of some melee attacks followed by our item spells is a nice way to fight off some enemies without using a lot of our actual magic. Black Shirt should do some good work here. Oh yeah. The only one left is that one in the front that didn't get any melee attacks before, so we're just going to do an all-out attack to finish him off. Get out of here, Air. And punch, punch, punch. And poof. Like that, he was gone. Make your way over to the right and head down this long hallway. There's no reason to hold anything back now. Once we get this last treasure chest, it makes a lot of sense to just exit this place using the exit spell. If you don't have any exit spells available, you could use warp magic. You'll need to use a lot of them. But you cannot get out of the Temple of Fiends past without using one of those spells. There's no way you can do it. Over here we meet some rock goals. So we'll fight them off. Remember, they're pretty strong against magic, so we're going to want to use melee attacks to fight them. And on this floor, you could happen to fight Iron Golems, which is an extremely rare enemy encounter, but they're like these guys, but super powered up. So if you ever see those, you're going to want to focus your melee attacks on them as well. You can beat Iron Golems, they're not actually that big of a deal. And after those are defeated, Game reaches level 26, which means he should actually be able to cast Nuke twice now. And here it is, the game's last treasure chest. The only item that we haven't gotten yet. 
we can throw away one of these garbage items that we found in the Temple of Fiends present. And here it is. The Mazmune. This is another iconic series staple. There's almost always a Mazmune or some similarly named sword in the game. This one is excellent. It's not only the most damaging melee weapon in the entire game, but any class can use it. Even a black wizard or a white wizard. So yeah, for now we're going to equip the black wizard with it. And another thing that's awesome about the Mazmune is it increases your hit percentage so much that it adds at least one attack. Sometimes it may even add two. We are going to save the Cat Claw though. For the final boss, we'll change up our weapon configuration a bit so that the Red Wizard can actually use the Mazmune, and then we'll have three characters that can deal significant damage in melee combat, and that's going to be a great way to be able to take on the final boss. Make sure that you have 99 heal potions and save at the inn. And the next thing that we need to do before we go back to the Temple of Fiends and finish it is make our way back to the town of Leafine so that we can get that nuke magic. So that's what we're going to do next. It is a little bit of a hike, remember you have to walk there. But it's not going to be very difficult at this point in the game. Our characters are super powerful. The place where you'll find the magic store here is in sort of a hidden location. It's up here in the upper right corner and then you just have to walk a little bit. And there it is. This is also where you would buy the Life 2 spell if you had a white wizard. Life 2 is a pretty cool spell that can actually bring a character back to life with full health. So that would be pretty sweet, but it's unnecessary. Being able to cast Life 1 will be good enough. So we finally have Nuke. But before we go back to the Temple of Fiends, let's just finish off our magic lists and get a few more level 8 spells for our black mage, and maybe even the last level 7 spell for our red mage. And we'll just finish off all the spells. So we got Ice 3 now for our red mage, so he has everything that he needs. In here, we can't unfortunately learn any of those spells for our red mage, which is sad. Cure 4 is a pretty good one and is one that you'll definitely want to get if you have a white mage. Cure 4 will restore someone's health to full when you cast it on them in battle, and it will even release them from status effects like paralysis. So yeah, Cure 4 is quite awesome, but I don't think it's worth carrying around a white mage for. Over here is where the last level 8 magic spells are. There's Stop, and we can pick between Zap and XXXX. We're probably never going to cast any of those spells. The fact of the matter is, Nuke is just better than all of them, so, well, that's what we're going to do. And we can't get any level 8 white magic using a red mage. Red mages just don't do that. But that's okay, because the red mage is going to do serious damage with that Mazmune sword whenever we fight the final boss, so we are still going to be happy that we had him. Up here in Crescent Lake, there's a few more spells that we might need. So let's get the very last ones in our collection. We'll head up here to the magic shop. And we'll stop over here for the black magic. For game, I guess we can get Quake, although it looks a lot more like cake, to be honest with you. And we can pick up Rub too, because, well, you know, why not? It just seems like a lot of enemies are resistant to those spells, so there's not a lot of use for them. In Viz 2, that's a good one, so certainly pick that up for your Red Mage. That's something that you may actually want to cast. I do regret getting Fog instead of Fire, but everything else for the Red Mage I think was pretty good. And this set of spells for the Black Mage is definitely solid. And well, with all the spells earned, it's time to go back to the Temple of Fiends. We can stop at the inn to save the game, just so that everything is all set. Make sure that we have our items equipped if they need to be equipped. So we'll equip that Mazmune. Certainly haven't put that on yet. And let's take a look at our final stats. 67 damage from the Knight, 52 from the Master. 
the red mage coming out nice with 45. And even the black wizard with 63, but just because he's using the Mazmune. Whenever the red wizard equips that thing, he's going to be able to deal a ton of damage. And that's it. The time for procrastination is over. It's time to go back. Back to the past. We'll just fly over the world, give it one last look over, as we make our way to our final destination. And here we go. Once more we'll go through the time portal, and this time we're just going to move forward to floor B4, and whenever you cross this patch, well this is where you're going to have to fight Tiamat again, and that Brack trick, well it doesn't work this time. This time we want to treat Tiamat more like a standard boss. She has 1100 hit points, which is quite a bit, so make sure to use your fast magic on your melee attackers so they can get more hits in. And more hits they will get. We're just going to use a lot more fighting, and magic is not super effective against this guy, so we can try spells like Invis 2, which might make us able to evade a little bit better. And, well, if we're going to use something here from the Black Mage, well, we might as well use something powerful. So we'll throw that out there, but we do want to save our nuke magic for the final boss. We'll use Lit 3 here to take down Tiamat. And a few more swings should finish it. Oh, Bane. Well, you didn't know it, but we're actually strong against Bane, Tiamat. Sorry to tell you. So just keep on battling and it shouldn't take too much more. You'll notice that the red mage just can't hack it against this guy, not with the weapon he currently has. So before we fight the final boss, we're definitely going to want to switch over the Mazmune. Head over to this stairway, and this will take us to the final floor, the Temple of Fiends, floor B5. There's no enemies on this floor save one, the final boss, Chaos. And here he is. Make sure that you heal up before you talk to this guy, although you will need to talk to him a few times before the battle will begin. Don't forget to switch the Mazmune over to the Red Wizard. We definitely need him to have that weapon. And here's the M. Night Shyamalan twist. The final boss was Garland, the first boss that we beat all the way back in the beginning of the game. It seems that the Fiends sent him back in time, and he sent the Fiends forward in time, and a loop was created. Well, it's time to end that loop. It's time to defeat Chaos. And there he is in all his glory. Chaos is a pretty cool looking boss. Make sure to use fast on your melee attackers in the first round so they can get in as much damage as possible. Whenever we get to the second round of combat, we're going to want to make sure that we use fast on our red wizard as well and then we can get the Black Wizard starting to cast spells like Nuke to do a little bit of extra damage. The big thing in this fight is we'd like to be able to kill Chaos before he casts Cure 4 on himself. Now, Cure 4 is kind of deep in his list of spells. It comes after Slow 2, so he's going to cast several spells before it's time. But if he gets that Cure 4 off, well, that will restore him to full health, and that will be very, very bad news. If he attacks one of your party members, they'll probably become paralyzed, and that will effectively take them out of the fight, so that's also pretty bad. You just have to kind of roll with the punches here. If anyone's paralyzed or taken out of the battle, well, you just won't be able to use them. And if anyone does get slow to cast on them, well, you can use fast to fix it. But remember, Slow 2 is the last spell that Chaos will cast before Cure 4, so make sure you get an all-out attack as soon as he casts Slow 2, just in case Cure 4 is coming. And that's it. We've done it. We've beaten Final Fantasy. All we can do now is sit back, relax, and enjoy the cheesy ending. The ending 
is, well, it's just a big wall of text. Although it does wrap up the story, which is nice. I have to admit, when I was a kid and I beat this game, I was very disappointed with the ending. Final Fantasy is such a long game. I was hoping for something with animations, pictures, all that sort of thing. Now that I'm an adult, I can certainly appreciate the wrap-up of the story a lot more. This was a pretty cool thing that they did, having a time travel story built in here. And this whole idea of a time loop? I mean, isn't that sort of like the plot from Marvel's Endgame? Yeah. Well, you saw it here in Final Fantasy many, many years before that movie ever came out. Although, of course, it was in the comic books before that. In any case, what was wrong has now been set right. The Light Warriors are returning, and as they travel in time, the world returns to normal. Will they even remember what they did? It's hard to say, but at least we were victorious. One thing that is cool about the concept of a time loop is that it sort of explains how this video game makes sense. It's a video game, so it's something that we could play over and over again. We could do different things each time, but essentially, it always begins and it always ends the same way. Much like the story here in Final Fantasy, it mirrors the idea of an RPG video game. So that's kind of a neat concept. The story here does ramble on a little bit too much. It goes a little bit Yoda at one point when it says never turn the forces of stuff to the dark side and the legend will live on, passed on by peoples maybe unsure where the story came from. Yeah, this, this goes on for a long time. I do wonder if the ending in the Japanese version is mostly the same, or if the translation team wrote a lot of this themselves. Whether it is the same as the original Japanese story, or whether the English localization team added a lot of this stuff in, it is nice to finally have some closure. So I hope that this video was able to help you finally beat Final Fantasy and free this world from the evil chaos that had befallen it. If it did, make sure to give this video a like and make sure to subscribe for more videos. Because there will always be more fantasy worlds to rescue, always more time loops to break. And that's why we'll be back again next week with another video game you can beat. Thanks for watching.